Acupuncture. Listen to this, how about this? Acupuncture removes blocks to conception, redresses subtle imbalances, and by placing needles along the conception vessel meridian, prepares the womb for pregnancy, with a pregnancy rate of 60%. This is taken from The Guardian, so of course it must be true. But what a load of absolute anatomical nonsense. And I've argued this for a long time. And then I came across a friend, who, a friend from many years ago, who is practicing acupuncture in England, in London, with a very lucrative practice. And she kept going on about how her patients were having acupuncture, then IVF, and they were all getting pregnant. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the argument went on for a year. And in the end, I said, you know what? We're going to do a randomized controlled trial, which we did and which has now been completed. 157 women undergoing IVF. 79 had acupuncture plus IVF. 78 had IVF alone. They were randomized. And you look at the results, hopefully it's clear here. Look at the bottom line, 50% live birth with acupuncture, 18.7% live birth with IVF and no acupuncture. So I lost uh, a rather sizable bet. It cost me uh, a good dinner in a restaurant in uh, London and I went over all the figures and went over all the methods. I couldn't fault anything along the way there. Numbers are small, but a very definite, significant difference. Maybe I was wrong, but I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Reflexology, Bowen technique, the endocrine system and the pelvis are addressed. Now what that means, I don't know, or do you say, hello endocrine system, hello pelvis, after two sessions, 13 of 23 pregnant uh, women were pregnant. Again, written down, recorded, but who believes it? Homeopathy. The idea here is that you dilute anything by one in 10,000 parts, and this will cure you. Listen at this, transubstantiation of inert substances by shaking and diluting them endlessly. Well, alternative medicine's been spreading. This is a fairly old slide that's taken from a few years ago, but already more than 6% of the general population, at least in uh, Israel and Holland where I've worked, are uh, using alternative medicine in order to get pregnant. And that number is up to 20% in both the USA and Australia. The Dutch Patient Union, Freya, which is a very powerful uh, organization, it's the patient's organization, uh, they recommend all of the alternative treatments. In fact, it's easier to get a grant now for a study uh, employing alternative medicine than it is for conventional medicine. There's a lot of money available in Germany, in the USA, you can get it from the NIH. And in the UK, of course, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Charles is a very strong uh, supporter of alternative medicine. Here you can see him asking the surgeon why he's taking out the appendix instead of using homeopathy. <laughs> There's been all sorts of data clinical trials using a Senjing pill, acupuncture for severe oligospermia, sperm parameters improved by selenium, all sorts of uh, vitamins, extremely diluted pollen cures hay fever, all, the, all published in very reputable journals, favorable effects of prayer on coronary care patients, and uh, this one I like, acupuncture to correct breach presentation published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And in the US, astrology. That's what does the trick if you want to get pregnant. So astrology will come onto the NHS as well. 
So Liam Farrell, who writes for the BMJ, came to the conclusion he's a strong believer in integrated medicine. After every consultation, I give my patients a teddy bear to cuddle and play them a tune on the banjo. He reckons this is great treatment. A few years ago now, we wrote about the place of IVF. Where should it be used? It should be used as primary treatment. I think everyone will agree. Mechanical infertility, severe male infertility, for oocyte donation, surrogacy, mm -hmm. and PGD. I don't believe it should be offered for primary treatment for the hypog hypog patients, anovulation, PCOS, and mild and moderate sperm problems. All these have easier and cheaper alternatives to IVF. But what about unexplained infertility? What should be the approach here? Well, this came from uh, Gleisher. IVF should be offered as first-line therapy to all infertile couples, regardless of the type of infertility. What a load of balderdash, <coughs> ball uh, but I'm not terribly surprised as it comes from uh, Gleisher and the Americans, but this is absolute nonsense and was published in Fertility and Sterility. If you use IVF for absolutely everything without any other treatment, it's a bit like treating a boil on the finger instead of lancing it and using antibiotics is amputating the arm. It's exactly the same. Why use a sledgehammer to treat something that can be so easily done? Now, unexplained infertility covers about 25-30% of all the cases that uh, we see. As you know, it's a lack of a diagnosis and there have been several definitions. Most of them include one to three years of regular unprotected intercourse when the test for ovulation, tubal patency and semen analysis are all normal. Now we're going to need IVF more and more and there's going to be more cases of so-called unexplained infertility because sexual intercourse is going out of fashion. You can see, and this was published by the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles in the UK, published, I think, in the BNJ, people having less sex than they did in the 1990s, and you look at the figures for 2010, 2012, way down. I don't know what the reason is for this. Maybe the advent of mobile phones and people are playing with the mobile phones rather than with other things, uh, but nobody has offered uh, a, an explanation for these figures. So, when should we be intervening in unexplained infertility? I think most people will agree, if you're over 35 years old, a female, uh, one year is enough to intervene. Less than 35, uh, especially those who already have children, then you're probably better off waiting for two years before intervening. So up to 30% of all couples uh, presenting with infertility after one year, if you don't intervene for three years, somewhere between 30 and 60% will conceive without any intervention. So I think we have to divide our unexplained infertility into good prognosis and a poorer prognosis. You see here, good prognosis, less than two years infertility, less than 35 years old, previous pregnancy, we're much better off probably leaving those alone rather than the poorer prognosis over three years infertility more than 35 years old uh, then of course it's worth uh, intervening just one word here that we label several patients who may be 40 years old or older as unexplained infertility when really we're talking about a reduced ovarian reserve a few studies now comparing IVF with uh, IUI and ovarian stimulation. One, in this case, one cycle of IVF against three cycles of uh, IUI. Ongoing pregnancies, almost exactly the same. Less than two years infertility, less than 35 years old, were found to have a similar chance of pregnancy with or without IUI or with or without IVF. Again, evidence 
that with a good prognosis leave them alone. So this is a study from Holland where it was suggested uh, that 544 patients with unexplained infertility, some they call the overtreated group, that's those who were uh, who had treatment within six months of uh, having the diagnosis or having no diagnosis versus expectant treatment when no treatment was given at all. And it turns out that if you do intervene quickly or whether you leave them alone, then the results, ongoing pregnancy, exactly the same. So what possibilities have we got for treating unexplained infertility? Well, I'm going to drop two of those out because IUI on its own and gonadotrophin <coughs> stimulation and clomiphene and IUI have been found to be pretty useless, which leaves us with expectant treatment, gonadotrophin's IUI, or IVF ICSI. Why use IUI? It seems ridiculous if the sperm is normal, um, and why stimulate ovaries which are ovulating normally? Well, the excuse is our superovulation may overcome some subtle defect in ovulatory function. It will increase the number of eggs available and it increases estradiol levels. Whereas uh, doing an IUI with normal sperm, how does that help? Well, you have a greater density of good motile sperm placed closer to the oocyte and the timing is usually much more accurate. So if we're going to compare the treatment of unexplained infertility using either IUI and COH against IVF, what we have to take into account is the efficiency, multiple pregnancy rate, complications, dropouts, and the cost efficiency. Now IVF, you will agree, is more invasive, has more complications, less compliance, a higher cumulative dropout rate, and it is more expensive when compared to IUI. People have said, yeah, but with IUI you get more multiple births. This is no longer the case. You actually get more multiple births in uh, IVF uh, than you do in IUI. Uh, admittedly, these figures uh, are the official figures from 2009, uh, but ones a bit later had a, a similar story. Live birth rates, are they so low with IUI? Well, apparently not. If you give IUI and uh, proper uh, ovarian stimulation for three cycles, then you can achieve uh, a, a live birth rate or ongoing pregnancy rate of around 25, 27%. And these are good figures. Cost efficiency, I don't think there's much doubt that IUI is much cheaper than IVF. And these are a few of the studies that have been done. Just the bottom line here, an updated uh, Cochrane database. No difference in live birth rates, IVF versus IUI plus stimulation. Uh, very little difference between the two. And then the National Institute for Clinical Excellence in England, NICE, comes out, NICE being the Bible in the UK uh, for treating our infertility patients, and they came out with this extraordinary statement saying, give expectant treatment for two years, if they're not pregnant by then, go straight to IVF. I got a problem with this because there's no evidence at all for giving this recommendation. And we did a, a, a survey of members of the British Fertility Society and 136 members of, the, of this society responded and only 16% actually agreed with the NICE recommendations. 30% would definitely not change their uh, process of uh, IUI, so it didn't go down very well. Since then, more evidence has come about, especially from this uh, group in uh, Holland, and this is a massive study. 600 couples randomized into three groups. One group had uh, IVF, three cycles with single selective embryo transfer. 
one group six cycles of IVF with a, a modified natural cycle and one group six cycles of IUI and stimulation and as you can see live births identical we did our own study which was actually initiated before the NICE guidelines what we wanted to examine was patients who'd never had any treatment three cycles of IUI and uh, stimulation versus one cycle of IVF or ICSI we randomized 207 patients uh, the first author here is uh, Anupa Nandi. This will be published next month in Fertility Sterility. What I can show you here, mainly concentrate on the live birth rate. It was almost 22% with the IUI and 34% with IVF. Now, IVF obviously came out better, uh, although this was not significant. But these are large numbers. We had 100 in each group who were randomized. I think the point that should be made here is that if you don't do IUI, then 22% of your patients will be prevented from having a live birth with the simple treatment of IUI rather than going straight to IVF. Are we overusing IVF? Well, you can see how the so-called diagnosis of unexplained infertility has gone up from 2000 to 2011. 18% of the IVF cases were unexplained infertility in the year 2000. This has risen to 32% now. The conclusion was that IVF treatment is affected if the subfertility is greater than four years. If it's less than 2.5 uh, years, then don't go straight to IVF, use alternative treatments. So the conclusion from this is there's no convincing evidence to indicate a change in policy to use IVF as the first line treatment instead of stimulated uh, IUI. Uh, leaves me with uh, the last slide. It just shows uh, you always have to examine uh, before you actually believe anything. Thank you very much for listening. In the area of personal, personalized medicine. Um, I don't speak as Chris, Dr. Chris Yap. Um, just a couple of um, details on uh, Chris. He's an independent uh, consultant uh, working in uh, technology and, f and uh, futures thinking. Um, he has over 30 years experience in the uh, IT industry and have worked uh, with um, IT giants including uh, HP and Microsoft. Um, he has been involved in uh, future of education for over 20 years uh, and has written and lectured in many countries on the challenges of personalized learning in the 21st century. He's a graduate of uh, Magdalene uh, College, Oxford, and holds a honorary degree at uh, DTEC at uh, uh, Glasgow Caledonian uh, University. Um, he's a fellow of uh, Royal Society of Arts. I'd like to invite uh, Chris to give his talk. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I'd like to add my thanks to, um, to Ebo for the generous hospitality and uh, the opportunity to share with you some ideas on, um, on, on this, the road to personalised medicine. Every few weeks now in the UK and across Europe, uh, and especially in the States, there are conferences after conferences, and personalized medicine is one of those big topics that people are talking about. Um, they're, do they're talking about it more than they're doing it, I think would be the fair, the fair um, description, I think, of the state of where we are. So what I want to try to do is to give you a sense of um, the journey that I think medicine is on and some of the challenges, because I think uh, you'll see when I show you some of the um, uh, 
some of the arguments around this that uh, there's, a, there's a lot to do and people may try to push it too fast and I think that clinicians need to get ahead of this rather than allow um, policy makers to try to drive something before it's, before it's ready. Um, I think it would be... Um, <clears throat> essentially there are three things I want to do in this. I, I want to start by actually asking about what can we know about the future? You know, I mean, we all know that there's lots and lots of famous um, examples. Bill Gates, 640K is enough for anybody, times Watson of IBM. I can see a market for maybe five computers in the world. You know, we, we have a pretty bad track record of forecasting. So I want to try to, to give you some insight as to how, how to think about the future. And I also want to try just to describe briefly some tools for thinking, some ways of organizing your thinking about how you can further personalize and how you can bring some things in. And then I want to talk about personalized medicine example and I'll give you some, some of the oddities that, um, that, that we're seeing. And uh, I recently did an event with senior management of the NHS. Um, this, this was a very, very hot topic um, for those people who do it. I thought I'd start with a quote of one of the great futurists and public intellectuals of our time. Uh, I never predict anything and I never will, dear old Gaza. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, so let's, so let's, let's have a look. And um, there's a series of questions up there. You know, what, what will be the price of Brent crude in, on a particular date? What will the average age of a UK based woman given birth for the first time in 2020? Will there be a civil war in China? Do you find some, do you think that you would have a better insight into some of those questions than others? Would you feel happier giving an answer to some of those questions than another one? Yeah? So w which one would you feel least comfortable doing? Anybody? Financial. Right? Right, right, yeah, okay. I'll let you in on a secret. Michael Gove actually had a point when he said we're sick of experts. And that is all those people you see on the television writing pundits have no better insight into the future than you do. You are as likely to be as accurate on any one of those questions um, as a China expert, as somebody who's an oil trader. And I want to try and show you why, because I think it's very important. There's a phrase that goes around in future circles, is expertise provides no insight. Um, and I want to try and show you why that's the case. So, <clears throat> the question is, there's a guy called Phil Tetlock, and he's been studying people's predictions for about 40 years. Lots and lots of papers published. Um, and then a couple of years ago, he wrote this book called Super Forecasting. And what's important about it is that there are some people who are much, much better at forecasting the future than others. And the thing is that they, um, he's got a group of them, and he can fire them, any of those sort of questions I had up there, on any topic and they actually come up with better forecasts than experts in specific sectors. And he's based his model that he's been using for some 30 years on, on a, a model that came from the Oxford philosopher Isaiah Berlin called the fox and the, and the hedgehog. And the hedgehog knows only one thing. They only see one way of the world. They have a dominant picture of the world. Whereas foxes have many, many different ways, and every problem they come up with, they tackle in a different way. And the really interesting, just imagine you're down the bar, down, down the road, um, with a group of strangers, and they discover that you work in health, so they start talking about the, future, the state of the NHS. If you were entirely surrounded by hedgehogs, there might be, say, a Catholic, and the first thing they talk about is abortion. There might be a, uh, an animal rights expert, you know, and they would start talking about um, testing on animals. You then switch the story to the rise and fall of Leicester City. And what happens? The animal rights person knows nothing about football, but he doesn't know why they're nicknamed the foxes. So the thing is that they have a dominant model. And the big problem is for most people, or when you're going about your day-to-day -day job, the hedgehog mode is the one that dominates. People who think like foxes and tackle things in multiple ways actually are much better forecasters 
and that's why putting lay people on committees improves the expertise of committees and there's lots and lots of evidence for it. So it's not just a nice to do, it actually improves the ability to forecast. So one of, one of the organisations I do work with, um, they actually have Fox Time and they actually have this idea that when they're facing it, they say, is this a fox meeting or is this a hedgehog meeting? Uh, and it gives people permission to step outside their own expertise and actually start to do it. So let's, let's look at it. <clears throat> One of the important things, um, an old colleague of mine from Hewlett Packard, uh, Bill Sharp, was very, very unhappy with these timelines that people do. 2018 will do this, 2020 will do that, 2025 will do this. And that kind of forecasting we don't actually find very helpful because people tend to make big mistakes with it. And what, what if we found is this model, which he developed about five years ago, actually is much better. So you've got three horizons. The first horizon is the, what, the way we do things now. So if I walked into 100 clinics, 90 of them will be doing this. So those are all of the things that dominate the way we do it. The second horizon is the kind of things, the innovations that we're playing around with. There might be 10 or 20 of them that people are doing. It's the kind of thing that you come to talk about at practitioner conferences, like this one. The third horizon is the thing that's maybe, there's one example somewhere, like a womb transplant, which is not very common. And the question is, is that going to change the way we do things downstream? And if you just stand there, you can see if you go forward in time, the first horizon starts to decline. Some of the innovations of the second horizon start to become important. And some things way out that just sound totally science fiction or weird start to become part of the new second horizon. And so you can start to push in there um, as you go forward and you can start to make intelligent judgments as to when you think it's, this is going to hit you, your clinic and your discipline. Right, so my interest in personal medicine um, came about when I went to hear the head of health globally at IBM who did a talk on the next 10 years in medicine and he was talking about artificial intelligence, data, big data and analytics, the empowered patient taking control of their intention, and robotics, and things like remote surgery and all sorts of different things. I'll let you in on the, the central point. That was 1986. I could stand up today and virtually give the same presentation he gave in 1986. And it, apart from changing one or two terms, it would largely be um, pretty much the same. Um, and that it's therefore very easy to be cynical and to believe that uh, somehow um, this will never happen. But I want to try and show you something quite important here. I'm going to give you an example from a different sector. How many of you have got a Kindle or an e-book reader? Okay. How many of you have um, copy, uh, out of copyright books, say a Jane Austen or a Scott Fitzgerald or something like that on your book? So a number of you, okay. So the point is, what you've seen, and most of you will think about the last 10 years, we didn't have e-book readers and they came out of virtually nowhere. It's not true. Um, I'm gonna go back to 1940, well, 1944. Um, a guy called Vannevar Bush, who was in the White House, he was the founder of ARPA, the ARPANET, and therefore the internet. Um, set up the, the research agencies for post-war reconstruction in there. And in October 1946, in the Atlantic Review, he wrote a paper, The Way We Will Think. And he introduced this concept of the memex. Um, in 1965, Ted Nelson invented hypertext. That was six months after the mouse was first demonstrated. And in 1965, he invented the idea of micropayments. Every time you click on that link, you know, um, on, on the web. That was Ted Nelson's work in 1964. 1971 was Project Gutenberg. That was the attempt to get a very precise time in a very precise location. What we've done in Chicago, um, to give you 
one example, which they can now grow tomatoes in vertical farms inside buildings using 5% of the water that takes to grow tomatoes in the wild, using one tenth of the nutrients. That's the kind of level of efficiency. In medicine, the idea, and I, I don't know how long it's going to take to get through the medical through the states, the idea is to be able to strap something onto your arm and be able to give you very, very small amounts of doses. So the idea in some areas is that instead of saying, give me 275 milligram tablets, this is the range I want this patient to be in, put it on, on there and deliver small amounts of the medicine to get them into that, set maximum for a 24 hour period, but keep them in that sort of level. That's the kind of technology that, that is there, it's been demonstrated, but it's still not got through the medical approval. I've touched on this real-time monitoring of home and work and of medical robotics, you know, for example. The facility nip is one, might sound strange. If you could put sensors into bras and knickers and into men's underpants, and you could not measure that you could download the contents of their underwear at the end of the day, what what what what could you know about that patient that you don't know now that would be a very expensive treatment? Now this sounds you know, this is weird stuff, but we can do it. It is there, and it will give us that ability to be able to look at the um, and our patients, and, and the interesting thing, of course, is that in the United States, the cost of not complying with medical um, regimes is about 11 billion pounds a year. That's quite a, you know, it's a significant cost. So if you were able, from a T-shirt or a watch, to be able to tell if the patient wasn't taking their medicines, what would that do to your cost of the patient? But finally, this is quite a complicated slide, so bear with me. I just want to try and point out, this is the work of a neo schumpeterian economist, if you want to know what those are, ask Jill, called Carla Perez. And what she's done, she's done an analysis from the Industrial Revolution up to the modern times. And there is a repeating pattern, and it's very important here, which is that somebody invents something, it takes time to get it to the point where you can mass produce it. You then get a bubble, the dot-com bubble being a big, big one for the Industrial Revolution, whatever. This is where you create new millionaires, billionaires, and no doubt in time, trillionaires. You lose middle-class jobs, the rich get richer, the poor set inequality gets wide, the bubble bursts. If you read the book about the Great Train Bubble in 1848, and taken out tra railway and put bank in, you couldn't tell the difference between uh, the, the bank class. The technical bubble breaks down, takes about two years to recover from. About five years after that, you get a financial bubble. It crashes. It takes about ten years to recover from the financial bubble. Sounds familiar? But then you get the golden age on the other side. And when you get into the golden age, you get narrowing social inequality, the creation of more middle class jobs. And the reason that it, that structure takes about 30 years in the first one and 30 years in the second, you can see these patterns. So if she's right this time, somewhere about 2020, 2022, we will enter a new golden age. And what we will start to see is creation of better quality jobs, more interesting jobs, more jobs with requiring new skill sets. Um, but also we'll need to build new models of organization so, what are the real challenges? You know, if you go to a conference on personal life medicine, what are the things that I think you really need to focus on? What are the skills of the medical staff? Are we recruiting the right people at 18? Are we doing the right continuous professional development? You know, these are the problems. Are, is it right that people need four A's at A level in sciences to go to medical school? Is that the model for the future? There's a whole issue of the ethics and conduct of clinical trials in an era of personalised medicine. Let me give you um, an, an example on that. How can I do a double blind randomised clinical trial with summative assessment on you? You know, the, the, I, I did a review with the IPPR, one of the London think tanks, on 192 pilots funded by the NHS on telemedicine. 
none of which have gone mainstream, but over 100 perhaps in other countries, including Spain, which actually yeah, initially had the highest um, take up. And the biggest problem was the medical mindset was that the randomized clinical trial was the only way of evaluating. And in some cases, it isn't. But I think we really do need to start thinking about what the, the ethics and, and conduct of clinical trials is here. It has a huge issue on the psychological contracting relationship between the doctor and the patient as we start moving to personalized medicine. Let's take that an example outside your area. If I make a personal medicine for liver cancer just for you and it doesn't work, can you sue me? Or does it have to work 100% of the time? That's a really big challenge for us to be able to, to deal with. The whole issue of how we regulate personalized will. Will HFBA league tables make any sense when personalized medicine arrives? And finally, cybersecurity. And of course, I've got to mention that. But just two, two examples that, that actually do do something. Somebody published a paper on the hacking conferences recently showing that how you could actually switch off um, a, a, a pacemaker. One of the commercial pacemakers actually has his Bluetooth enabled. And they're actually able to switch it off. Just imagine you walking down the street and actually being able to switch off somebody's pacemaker. That's serious. That's a lot more serious than they um, I thought I might show you that in case any of you have missed the headlines. Uh, ho hopefully, it will be moved on after June the 8th. That's all I will say, but I just think you might have to do it. So, the point is the, the science, the technology, all of these things are coming together to be able to start moving towards a more and more personalized world. But the issues are not the science and the technology, they are the ethics, the values, the system. For one final example, I want to show you. An example I hope that you all know about because it's quite really quite important. And it's the Open University. I have the great privilege and pleasure of working with Michael Young, the inventor of the Open University, for the last seven years of his life as a trustee of the School of Social Entrepreneurs, the last of the hundred and something bodies he set up. In, in 1969, there were 150,000 students in higher education. In 1994, its 25th anniversary, there were 150,000 students in the Open University alone. Look at what it did. It built a campus with no students, set up summer schools. It moved from individual academics to academic teams. They had a TV studio in the middle next door to Walton Hall. New models of feedback and assessment. And they start, developed kits for home experiments. And they also did, I mean, for instance, virtual microscopes and able somebody with um, profound handicaps to actually do science experiments. You didn't change the education system by putting TVs into classical universities. You built an entirely new model of what a university was and how it might operate using television and video recorders. So the real challenge now is to think about how would you design the health system so that it was an open health system that worked in the clinic, in the home, in the office, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've been in, and this is the kind of thing. The likelihood, I think, is it's going to come from outside the current health service. Apple had enough money in the bank to run the NHS for two years. If Apple decided to open up hospitals, do you think they'd build them anyway, like the way we do them now? Google are working with um, the NHS through their subsidiary, DeepMind. What if Google starts going up opening hospitals? They've got the money. What would be their model? So I just want to just say something that then is final about the I actually do think you are leading the way towards personalized medicine in the US. I think the integration, you know, the dealing with the lifestyle factors, dealing with the medical interventions, you are ahead of many of the other areas. And I think the point is you ought to be trying to influence some of the others. But in order to stay ahead, I think we start needing to think very broadly about the kind of possibilities of what we might be able to do. The, really, the thing that slows everything down is the rate at which we can develop the skills and competencies of professionals to be able to manage these things at high level. That's the challenge. How will we need the legal framework to develop? The current HFBA Act, 
won't, isn't fit for an era of artificial gambling. We'll need a new kind of legislation to deal with that. We may also need a new legislation post Brexit. Demand management and early intervention. If I could have a wearable computer for a teenager that actually helps them deal with their with obesity, would that be better value than treatment? One of the points that Jill made here. And then finally, it's the whole societal challenges of this model. You know, we can do this for very wealthy, very um, exhausted you know, people. Can we do it for everybody? At what point can we actually roll this model out in here? And I think that, you know, we will start to know that personalized medicine is really arriving rather than just being stuff at conferences. When people are talking about how we engage the public to understand how we're going to change it. If you think health is slow, you should try education. And if you're in both, uh, you'll know how deeply complex and frustrating this is. So I hope that's been helpful, giving you an outsider's view of, of what we're up to. And that's why I said I think the question needs to be more far sighted and start thinking of so around you know, how would you organise so that people like that will really not don't need it. So trying to protect the current way of operating, you know, you will not be able to take advantage of the progress in a whole variety of technologies unless we change the way we structure. And I said if you've got the ability to manage the patient twenty four hours a day, you know, from home work, travel, whatever. How does that change the way we do it? What gets done in the clinic? What gets done in the medical? All of those things are going to be going to start to come through, but that's what's going to take us the time.
I think you know, one of the big problems, and not that colour of the period of that shows you there, when you go into Dolphin A, is that it does take you to rethink this, this, that rethinking the organisational model. And that's why it takes 30 years, because organisations at the end of the stand of the NHS, it's too big to be able to change everything. You know, one of the problems is that productivity goes down every time we reorganise. So probably you can only afford to do this once a generation. And that's why I think we need to start thinking about it now. And yeah, I, I've always worked with private sector, so I'm not worried about it. But what I am worried about is them taking it over, borrowing models from them, working with them. I'm very happy with what I think it is in say, You know, the, I, I agree with you. That was the point of the end, though, is that we need to think about it, look at how they operate, and can we take advantage of the way they operate to do what we do better, to better out them? And I think we can. Um, but it's that balance. And about selling it to the everybody again for coming. That is the second most beautiful building in Tamworth. Um, I'll show you the most beautiful building, that's the Norman Castle. Um, Tamworth was once the uh, ancient capital of Mercia, so before London existed, Tamworth was the big city. Um, I'm going to talk about things outside medicine that we can learn from that will help us do fertility medicine better. And two examples come from rather odd places. The Great Ormond Street Hospital discovered that if they followed the same rules that Formula One follows when they're doing changing a tire or refueling in a pit stop, then they would be able to improve the throughput of their patients and their outcomes. And what happens when you're changing a tire in a pit stop is that everybody has one job, they practice it, they know exactly what they're doing, they know exactly where to stand, and one person is standing outside and looking and supervising, and at the end, they have a debrief and find out how they could do it better. You can apply exactly the same thing to managing a, a, a heart attack. The um, McLaren Analytics, these again are people who um, are looking at racing cars, and they have thousands of sensors all over their cars, which feed back all of this information in real time to uh, center in Woking and they were able to predict when something was going to go wrong in time to be able to rectify it. And what they found at the Birmingham Children's Heart Hospital was if they put lots of sensors on the children with coronary problems then they too would be able to predict problems before they happened and go in and sort out that patient rather than doing a ward round and hoping to pick up problems sometimes even after they'd happened they could happen before. Now. The really important people in this field um, that I'm going to be talking about today is this guy, Daniel Kahneman, who developed this idea that we actually have two sorts of thinking, fast thinking, which is our instinctive thinking, it's rather lazy thinking, but it's what we do if we think we know what the answer to a particular problem is, so it's a kind of a reflex action. Slow thinking is much more difficult, it's harder work but it means that we have to try and get every single piece of evidence marshaled together before we make a decision. And sometimes, in fact probably most of the time for doctors, we're doing fast thinking because we've seen something very much like this before, so we assume it's going to be the same problem. But every so often we come unstuck, and because we haven't done 
collected all of the evidence properly, gone through the slow thinking model, then we miss something and that turns out to be crucial. Okay, this is the next really important guy, um, Erily. He was very badly burned in an accident and so spent a lot of time in hospital and trying to work out how it is that we manage pain. And I'll show you some of his results later, but one of the questions that he asked himself as he lay there in pain was, if somebody says to you, this might hurt, does it actually change your perception of the pain? And it turns out it does, that because people instinctively tense at the thought that something's going to hurt them, it hurts them more. So when we're taking blood from patients, don't say, this might hurt, say, you might feel this. And our final um, authors that we're going to be talking about, these are the two guys that came up with this concept that we now call nudge, that the Cameron government actually instituted as the behavioral management group. And the idea here is that people can be helped to behave better as patients, as citizens, if they're nudged in the right direction rather than being told what to do. So back to standard economics. This is a problem we have with trying to apply economic theory to complex situations like health. Standard economic theory says that all individuals are fully rational, that they're completely selfish, that they're forward thinking, and they make perfectly informed decisions because they have all the evidence to hand before they make their decisions. But unfortunately, patients aren't like that. And also, I suspect many doctors aren't like that either. And this is where we need some help from the new type of economics. Our patients are often dealing with a combination of concern and fear and obsession and depression and anxiety. And we know that where people are trying to make decisions under those influences, then they actually make very poor decisions. They're just too emotionally involved, emotionally overloaded. And that's the situation for most people that we would see in a fertility clinic. So the evidence that we're going to be looking at comes from this new field of behavioral economics, where we take classical economics and add in psychology, add in decision theory. And we've got years of it now. How do people make decisions when they don't have all the information that they really ought to have? How do people assess the risks, the benefits, and the opportunities of individual situations? And particularly in the area of health, how do people judge what's fair? Fairness is incredibly important to patients. I think you're probably aware that what upsets patients most about NHS funding for assisted conception is not that they either have only got one cycle, but that somebody else who lives in the next postcode gets two cycles, or no cycles, or three cycles. And many patients have said, well, why can't we just share it out? That would be so much fairer. So these are some of the key concepts I'm going to be talking about today. Choice architecture. This is the way that we are influenced to make decisions literally by the order in which we're presented with information. And the classic example is that if you're given a wine list and the wine is priced from the cheapest bottle to the most expensive bottle at the bottom, then people are more likely to choose a cheaper wine than if you reverse the order and have the most expensive wine at the top and the cheaper at the bottom. And that also applies to getting patients to opt in or out of um, things. If you have an opt-in system, such as we have for organ donation, people are less likely to opt in. If you have somebody ask them, would you like to opt in, they're much more likely to agree because they don't want to be thought of as the sort of person who doesn't want to help somebody else survive in the case of their death. So having, having a straightforward opt-in system doesn't work particularly well. What we need is this extra nudge to add a personal element to it. And of course, we're moving towards that now with every time you apply for a driving license, along comes the little thing. Have you thought about being an organ donor? Um, discounting the future is something that we're 
very bad at, that people tend to think about what's happening in the here and now, and we'll let tomorrow take care of itself. And that's particularly appropriate for fertility patients. Framing and priming is the way in which the way we ask a question can influence the way in which a patient responds. And I'll give you some examples later. Loss aversion, I think we're all used to that idea, that we tend to worry more about losing something that we've already got than we worry about getting something that we haven't already got, that we might be able to get. And it distorts the way in which we make these choices. So, as doctors, what is our primary duty? To help our patients come to the best decisions for themselves, their partners, and any future children. And we could say, actually, and the wider society, because everything we do has externalities. It affects other people. But then we've got problems, haven't we? Because now we've got the technological imperative that there are lots of things that we could do that would have a huge impact on individual people's health and on the general health of the population. Um, we know that a significant number of people are living with HIV in the UK and don't know, so they're not getting treatment and they're spreading it. We know that something like about 15% of people who've got type 2 diabetes don't know they've got type 2 diabetes yet. And by the time they do discover this, because they have some uh, collapse or finally decide to tell the doctor that they're um, having to go to the loo 27 times a day and, al and are always thirsty, often the damage has been done and the chance of reversing it has, has gone. We know that not screening people for hepatitis B and C whenever we have an opportunity means that we're having quite a, a, a spread of these problems. You know, it's just a blood test. What's the problem? We can help. But no, it's considered completely unacceptable to do, um, as it were, silent screening of the population. And this last one is, I think, highly relevant. PSEN 1 and 2, which are genes that stand for uh, pre-senilium, if you carry either or both of these genes, then you've got a 50% chance of developing early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. And given that that is going to be one of the most significant problems for care management, they said that we're going to have four times as many people living with Alzheimer's disease within the next 20 years as we've got at the moment. So as we all get older, but here, you, you do this test and either the, the patient can say, well, in that case, I'm not going to risk passing on my genes, I'll use donor gametes, or better still, perhaps, we can do a PGD and make sure the embryos that are replaced are not carrying this really, really horrible gene. And if you think what it's costing the population to look after folk with ordinary Alzheimer's disease as well as the early onset, then um, this would be really cost effective. Okay, so paternalism in medicine is one of those words that we don't use anymore. It's all about patient autonomy. But there is a libertarian approach to paternalism that might actually be more effective. So we won't ban or demand. We'll design our choices so that patients make better choices on their own terms, not because we've told them that this is the best thing for them to do. Sometimes they may prefer to stay with the status quo. You know, we do have patients who come along for investigations for infertility, and they've been trying maybe for four, five, six years. Uh, we do the tests and we say, mm, looks like it's unexplained. Um, now you've got seven years of unexplained primary infertility. The chance of getting pregnant naturally over the next two or three years is not great, but they don't want an intervention. They just wanted to know there was nothing that we could fix um, in a straightforward way. And then they will just wait and see. And if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't happen, so be it. So the availability heuristic, a heuristic is a rule of thumb. What we're saying, seeing here is that patients are very influenced by their own experience. So if somebody's, like in the second case, we've got the patient who says, 
I want IVF because my sister had boy and girl twins on her first cycle, she's been very influenced by the fact that someone she knows well, as far as she saw it, had won the jackpot the very first time she bought a lottery ticket. Now, there's no evidence base for that whatsoever. There is a good evidence base for saying, I want IVF soon, because my grandmother, mother, and elder sister all had an early menopause, but it's much more likely that someone will be influenced by the second, by the successful sister, than by the significant family history. So what does football have to tell us about fertility? Professional goalkeepers only save about 20% of penalties. And in my team, it's not even that good. And there are three strategies if you're a professional goalkeeper, well, any goalkeeper. You can stay in the middle, you can go left or go right. So what's the best strategy? What is actually going to produce the best outcome? It's actually staying in the middle, not trying to guess whether the ball is going to come to your left or to your right. But of course, if they do stand in the middle and the ball goes past them, all the supporters say, what are you doing? You didn't even move. <laughs> so the best strategy is to do nothing, but we've got this built-in bias for action. And this is why getting patients to expect, accept, expect and management is so difficult. Because doctor, do something. There must be something that can be done. And as Roy has shown us with those, that really elegant data, sometimes doing nothing is actually much better and infinitely cheaper and probably more fun for the patients. So, this is the other problem that we have with fertility medicine that I mentioned briefly before, our tendency to discount the future. We want something now. We don't want something in 5, 10, 15 years' time. But if we've got an obese smoker who wants fertility treatment, is it unfair to deny them? We can warn them that it increases their risks of gestational diabetes, that it might make it more likely that they died, that the outcome for their future child will be poorer if they're treated in their present condition. But because their immediate decision is weighed much more heavily than the future outcomes, it's very difficult to persuade people to follow our good healthy lifestyle advice for two years and then they can have their fertility treatment because they've already been on a waiting list for a year and they want their treatment now. And the problem too is that something being possible is always weighed more heavily than something being probable. And so even if we say your chances of a successful outcome are only half what they would be if you'd follow our advice. It's the possibility that it will be a successful outcome is much more important than any statistical numbers that we give to the outcome. And we've also got this other big problem of the optimism bias. Even if somebody's told that their chances are very low, they're still going to think, well, I'm the special one. So people like me may only have a 5% chance of a good outcome, but I'm going to be one of those five people in 100 who gets it. It's human nature. Okay, so we need to be very careful how we present data to patients. Many patients aren't particularly sophisticated with numbers. And this lovely piece of quite old research now uh, with Kahneman, the same man who wrote the book, um, Slow and Fast Thinking, um, had a, two groups the situation that they were told was that there was an outbreak of disease was expected and it was thought that about 600 people would be killed. Then two programs to prevent this carnage were proposed and one group was told that if strategy A was followed, 200 people would be saved and the alternative strategy B was that there was a one-third probability that 600 would be saved, and a two-thirds probability that nobody would be saved. Now, the other group were given the information that if they followed strategy C, 400 people would die, but if they followed strategy D, 
there was a one-third probability that nobody would die and a two-thirds probability that 600 would die. Now, as you can see, in the first group, 72% chose A over B. 200 people will be saved. That's a really positive outcome, given how horrible the prospect was. In the second group, an even higher percentage chose D over C, because that statement, 400 people will die, is unthinkable. But A and C are the same, and B and D are the same in terms of numbers of people dying. But it's the way it's put, the first 200 people will say, positive, optimistic, let's go for that. The other one, 400 will die. Oh, that sounds horrible, I don't want that. So how we present the data then is going to determine the choices that our patients make. This is a, a, a recent study that was done, and when they told um, women that taking tamoxifen prophylactically was associated with a risk of, oops, is that gone? Was associated with a risk of cataract. When, seven, when, when they were told 17 out of 100 patients would be affected, the majority accepted the treatment. When they were told that 170 out of 1,000 patients would be affected, the majority refused the treatment. They're the same numbers, but 170 people getting cataracts, that sounds awful. Don't want that. More problems with how we frame data that we offer. We've got two ways of presenting this. Your AMH suggests you have a 10% chance of a baby. Or, 90% of women with your results won't get pregnant and deliver. What happens? The bias towards optimism means that most couples will think that 10% is a good, positive thing. They want it. They'll be one of the 10%. If you frame it the other way, they'll say, oh, 90%. That's terrible. We perhaps will go for donor eggs. So, unscrupulous clinicians with vested interests, none of which of course are present, would think, oh, you know, the way that I tell the data to the couples will influence their choices, even if it's exactly the same numbers. So, let's see how the counsellors can help us with this problem of framing and priming. These are the sorts of conversations that maybe come best from the counsellors rather than from the doctors. We're not talking about whether you're going to start a treatment cycle today or next week or in a month's time. Let's talk about your future. How many children do you want to have? What would the gaps be between them? What sort of health do you want them to have? Tell me about health problems in your family that might be relevant. Then. With this information, we can talk about how to make the best opportunity to make this happen. So reflecting further on counselling, we know that the uptake of counselling impacts on fertility outcomes because we know the interaction between stress and infertility is very significant. We need to then work out what aspects of counselling are having this positive impact. And also, if people, perhaps working through these life patterns as a result of good counselling, then get spontaneously pregnant, can we count those pregnancies as a treatment effect? Okay, so I mentioned before that people don't like losing, or the prospect of losing what they've already got, and they are keener to avert loss than to achieve a gain. So, let's look at these two scenarios, which are obviously exactly the same outcomes. Would you accept a gamble with a 95% chance of losing five pounds if it gave you a 5% chance of winning 100 pounds? Or would you buy a lottery ticket for five pounds where there was a 5% chance of winning 100 pounds? The one on the left, that's viewed as a loss, and we don't like losses. 
the one on the right is viewed as a cost, and so we will avoid the loss and favor the cost. And access, take advantage of people's loss aversion when they package up for suitable um, patients, suitable couples, something that says, <coughs> pay up front for three cycles of IVF, and if you don't get a baby by the end of it, you'll get your money back. Of course, you won't get the drugs cost back and the time and, the, and everything else, but you'll get that. And, but of course, if you do get your baby on your first cycle, you've paid three times as much for the outcome that you would have otherwise had. But because people are so loss averse, they will think, well, if we get a baby, even if it's cost three times more than it would have cost if we'd just gone cycle by cycle, the avoidance of the feeling of regret, of loss, remorse, is so powerful that people sign up for this. So, here's our evidence. If there are potential positive outcomes, people fear loss more than the potential for gain. And this is true even in something like golf, where if a professional golfer has got one stroke to save par, he is much more likely to get his little white ball in the hole than if he's trying to secure a birdie for the same putt. So it's that you know, avoiding going over par is losing is much more important than even getting one below. Um, where we've got very low probabilities, people tend to overweight them. So in a situation where you've got a, a small a plane comes down and 80 people are killed, people are horrified. But in a month in a city, you could have 80 fatalities in car crashes, but people worry much more about, oh, perhaps I don't want to fly anymore, whereas we're all driving around in potentially much more hazardous scenarios. So again, how we ask the question changes the way that people make their choices, and we mustn't take advantage of that. And the other issue that we saw is that when everything looks negative and hopeless, then people seek risk. And this is what Nick Leeson did at Baring's Bank, that he'd lost a huge amount of money, and he gambled if he just kept putting in more money, he'd be able to get his money back, and the bank went bankrupt. We see this with some of our patients, too, that they've done absolutely everything that we've asked for their IVF cycle. They've been compliant with their medication. They've modified their lifestyle. They've done everything that they possibly could to make it work, and then that terrible coin gets tossed, and it comes down heads, it comes down tails rather than heads, and they've got nothing, and that was their one cycle of funded treatment. And the, peak, the couple who've been perfectly reasonable and sweet and attentive and lovely suddenly go into complete meltdown, you know, and they start literally throwing things because this, is, this outcome is so negative that they just don't care anymore. And we need to try and pick these people up. Okay, I don't think I've got time to go into that. Um, anyway, Roy mentioned acupuncture. Um, I mentioned acupuncture. There was a study that I always quite like, which showed that sham acupuncture outperformed real acupuncture in a trial. Um, the needles were put in the wrong place as opposed to the right place, so not on that womb meridian line that is supposed to <laughs> flow from somewhere. And um, but both sham acupuncture and real acupuncture did better than nothing. So that's quite a significant finding. Again, it could be all to do with stress reduction. But what's the trouble with that evidence is that people who believe in acupuncture said it wasn't a well-designed trial, and skeptics knew that, had always known that acupuncture was, had nothing to contribute. So if people believe that activity will lower their stress levels, it actually will, and it'll be helpful. And that's why placebos work, and they work very well. If you tell a patient that a pain relief drug is twice as expensive 
as the one they've been on previously, they'll tell you that they get much better pain relief from it. Okay. I want to end up by talking a little bit about altruism. Now, if you get three groups to raise money for a specific charity, and group A do it on a voluntary basis, and group B get to keep 1% of what they raise, and group C get to keep 10% of what they raise, which group actually raises more money? It's actually the group who are doing it on a purely voluntary basis because we like, we get a lot of good vibes from being altruistic and doing things for others. And if we get a reward, particularly if it seems to be quite a niggly little financial reward, that takes away all of that good feeling. And so people won't do it. And you need to actually pay volunteers a very significant proportion of what they raise for charity in order to get them to get more than if they're doing it on a purely voluntary basis. Okay, this is quite an interesting piece of research. They looked at judges' sentencing decisions based on what time of day and in relation to which meals they were making their decisions. And they found that shortly before lunch, they were much more likely to give a custodial sentence for the same crime than if they just had their mid-morning break or if they'd had their um, afternoon tea. So um, when we're making life and death decisions about who we're going to recommend has a cycle of IVF or anything like that, can we please make sure we're not a bit hypoglycemic because it makes us grumpy. Uh, the other thing that influenced them was they were much more likely to give a custodial sentence to obese people if they were hungry because it kind of reminded them at a subconscious level that they weren't having their lunch because this individual was there being so wicked. So let's do lunch. Um, I went on by talking a little bit about pain. Um, one of the most poignant, you know, everybody says that the... Uh, the Death of Bambi's mother is the worst bit of Disney, but it's not. It's the beginning of Dumbo, when Mrs. Jumbo, who's childless, is looking at the stork delivering by parachute all these babies to all these other mothers-to-be, and she doesn't get one. And that pain that's so visible in her eyes, we see with our patients too. And these are some of the words that patients have used to describe their perception of the pain of infertility. But it's because it's invisible and because they feel it's their fault and in their community it's a source of shame. And it's just with them the entire time and it's been there forever and they don't see that it's going to get cured. And we had one lady who always went shopping um, in the 24-hour Tesco's at midnight so she wouldn't have to see a baby in a buggy. And there was another uh, couple where the husband tried to uh, cheer her up after an unsuccessful IVF cycle and flew her on a lovely holiday to the West Indies, but he hadn't realized it was during the school holidays. And there were all these children on the beach, and she insisted that they got the next flight back home. So that is the extent of this invisible pain that we're trying to help. So I mentioned uh, earlier at the beginning who looked at how we manage pain based on his experience of suffering horrendous burns and being in hospital for a long time. And there are really three different sorts of pains, experience, and it's the pain that we experience and how we remember the pain that we experience that are relevant here. Here's chronic pain. It's kind of low-level pain, but it's there all the time, mild arthritis, bad toothache. Um, there's this sort of pain, which goes very high, very severe pain, but comes down very quickly, either because of the event, this is labor giving birth and suddenly it's all better again and you've got the baby, or very effective analgesia administered appropriately. And then there's this sort of pain, which isn't as severe, but comes down more slowly. And when people are asked to record the amount of pain they're in using a little um, monitor, then if they can actually make 
a register of the pain that they're suffering, oops, then um, they don't perceive the pain as badly. But when they're remembering the pain, it's the length of time of the pain rather than the absolute level of the pain that's most significant. So a very bad pain that comes down very quickly is remembered as being less severe than that less bad pain that took a long time to resolve. And if even that chronic pain goes on long enough, then that will be um, registered as the worst kind of pain. And I think this is very relevant for um, our field because I think it's being recognized now that there is an element of almost post-traumatic stress disorder associated with people's recollections of pain that they suffered. And that's why it really is Im important that we manage the analgesia adequately. Anyway, Beecham and Children's four principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice or fairness, remain at the heart of what we're trying to do in fertility medicine, but with behavioral economics, we can help patients achieve all four, I hope. So that's the other beautiful building in Tamworth, and that's our clinic. So thank you for your attention. And thank you very much for asking me to speak about this topic, which Jill was veering into, <laughs> and Chris too. So um, I just thought I'd start off by saying I'm not going to mention anything about acupuncture. That's been done this morning already. And I know you're all hyperglycemic, so you're not going to take very much in either. Um, so do ask others in the audience at the end who have much more experience than I any questions about cross-border reproduction um, after this session. Anyway, when I was asked to do this, I thought, where do I start? So I looked around for um, evidence as to why people do go abroad for treatment. And one of the papers I came across was the transnational reproduction which um, Alan Pacey is in the audience, was one of the authors. So again, any questions do ask Alan at the end of the session. Um, and obviously one of the main reasons that people went abroad were to seek egg donation. And interestingly, this was in 2010, um, the other reason was that they wished anonymous donation. And um, the HFE in the UK brought in um, known donors and I think it was 2005 or six. we had quite a discussion um, but it was certainly quite a few years ago now and that did have an impact on where patients went for treatment. The patient experiences that they reported at that time was that they went abroad because they had received negative responses from healthcare professionals in the UK now, everyone in the audience that works in the UK is sitting thinking, that's not my centre. They didn't have a negative experience with me. However, patients do perceive things differently from what we do when we're providing the care. And if they felt it was a negative experience, then that was their perception and they went elsewhere, as Jill's curtain maker did, um, <laughs> went elsewhere. Um, one of the, well, there were several issues as to um, continuing treatment within the UK and access to scans and blood tests and drugs in particular were also cited as a difficulty from a patient going abroad. Now, I do think this was seven years ago and I think centres now collaborate with other centres and makes it easier for patients. However, if patients go it alone and go abroad, they do find significant difficulties in finding a centre that will undertake the scan, undertake the blood test, and particularly, I think, from our experience, GPs do not want to know about patients going abroad for treatment and have been quite unhelpful to several um, cases. Um, Patients found they were unfamiliar with healthcare systems. They, they thought they were going to a very like-for-like -like situation. It was a fertility centre, so it would be the same. And they felt the treatment was not highly regulated. However, there's lots of different reasons that patients went abroad. The recommendations from this report 
were twofold. The first I'm not going to discuss at all uh, in this forum. And the second was that we should facilitate good practice to safeguard patients going abroad for treatment. And this should be providing accessible information um, about treatments and also about costs. They also suggested that we should provide a list of questions for patients to take with them when they were in that situation. And one of the key uh, recommendations was that the HFEA, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, and patient support groups should work together to give links um, of information. They actually cited in the paper about independent research I'm not quite sure the HFE have gone down the route of independent research, but those of you that have accessed the HFE beta website, their new website, on the front page there is a section of what are the next steps for getting treatment abroad. It's very highly visible, and if you click on the fertility treatment abroad, it takes you through lots of um, options about clinics. There are sections, I don't have a pointer, and I hope you can see, but there are sections about um, going abroad for treatment, treatment options, clinics, agencies, popular destinations, costs, patient stories, and my fertility treatment. When you click on the clinics, oh, I can, maybe I can. When you click on the clinics, you can um, see several clinics from throughout the world. You actually click in the country, and I'm afraid Crown is not on that list, and I'm not sure how you get on that list, um, but maybe it's something that you can look into. Um, but you can sit, when I went to um, Cyprus, there's 10 centres that HFE have on their website, and each of those centres, it tells you um, about the profile, inquiries, approximate cost, and their good practice score. As I say, I'm not entirely sure how you get on it, but it's maybe something that you would like to look into. Oops, I'm just going back. And the other thing that's on the HFE website um, that patients reported that they wanted to know about was the cultural differences between the UK and the country they were going to. So the HFE have pulled together, I just clicked on Spain, but it could be about any country that you choose to go to, and it will tell you about their healthcare system and the rules and regulations. It's actually quite helpful, and I have to say, until I was preparing for this talk, I didn't even know it was there. Has anybody else looked at it? Am I the only one, maybe? No? Oh, that's good. I always like to learn. Every day's a school day, isn't it? <laughs> um, so one of the things that patients really wanted to know was information about where they were going. And also, centres within the UK sometimes felt that they gave much better information than patients got in overseas centres. One of the things we do at clinics is we give lots of information verbally. We talk to or at patients um, from the minute they come into the centre. And not everyone can listens to what's being said, and not everyone hears what you think you have said. And Winston Churchill, who's a man of many quotes, had this statement which I thought was very pertinent um, about a colleague. He is one of those orators of whom it was well said, before they get up, they do not know what they are going to say, and when they are speaking, they do not know what they are saying, and when they have sat down, they do not know what they have said. And sometimes I think patients feel a little bit like that. There's so much information being given to them, and you think you have said that, and it could be the third <coughs> patient you've seen for that consultation that day. And it is very difficult sometimes to remain focused, but patients listen and they hear not always what you have said. Now, within the UK, we do love our standards, and NHS England, has got a standard for information given. There are six principles, and I'm not going to bore you with them all because I can see that hypoglycemia sinking down to your shoes as I speak. Um, they are the standard things that you would expect when you're writing, oh gosh, that's very loud, um, 
when you're writing an information sheet, but it's actually quite a useful framework um, to have. Um, do you have a defined documented process? Evidence, we hear, we've heard about evidence throughout the morning. Um, only use trustworthy evidence. Oh, I said I wasn't going to mention acupuncture, but here you go. <laughs> um, have, you, have you asked your patients about your, your information sheets? You can write it and think, that's it. Give it to the patient. They might ask for something different. How many, how many people actually sit down or give the, their draft information sheets to patients to look at? Well done, Jill. <laughs> I can see behind the pillar there. Um, so giving information, and Gillian did start speaking about this, giving information is key to patients. We, are, we need patients to give informed consent, and the only way they can give informed consent is to give them information. So informed consent is a key process, and again, within the UK, in the early days of cross-border reproduction, there was a, a perception that the patients were being asked to give consent without appropriate information. But I think one of the other big worries from patients and clinics were that donors were not being um, given the appropriate information and um, therefore not able to give informed consent. The HFEA has, gives us this three steps that we, we have to follow before a patient can um, give consent. Enough information to enable them to understand the nature, purpose and implication, suitable opportunity to receive proper counselling, and information about the procedure for varying or withdrawing any consent. Now, the items in bold, understanding and proper counselling, are ones that have been around for a long time, because how do you know patients have understood what you said? And for those of you who are not familiar or far too young to remember the Churchill adverts, this was an advert for an insurance company and this dog had a nodding head, and that's what it did all the time. And how many times have you been in a consultation and the patient does it, and you can actually think they're not entirely sure <laughs> that they are listening, actively listening, that they want to agree with you, they want to move on, they want to sign the consent, they want to get on, on to the treatment. So actually, how do, you, how do you reassure yourself and make sure your patient does understand what's been said to them. Sometimes you can ask open-ended questions. Sometimes you have to say, do you understand this much, this much? There's various options that you, that you can use. And I think Chris and Jill were speaking a little bit about um, how you phrase things, how you frame questions, how you frame information is also quite key. Personally, I am very wary of the nodding dog patient because I do have to just stop and say, Are you, can you just tell me what, what, what you've understood from that discussion? The other phrase is proper counselling. And I did anticipate that Chris would be in the audience today and thought, oh gosh, how can I speak about counselling? Um, so I'm slightly nervous about this. Um, and there's lots of discussion about the phrase proper counselling. But there's a huge difference between a professional counsellor, who's a highly trained individual, and someone that just gives advice. We've got three pictures here, and you could say any of them could be proper counselling. It's, it's a phrase that's used quite freely. And again, when people go overseas, one of the first things that they have to think about is the counselling and um, do they understand. And certainly, when we started collaborating with a centre, that was one of the key people that we went to meet, was the, was the counsellor. And counselling is not quite a few things. It's not giving advice. It's not being judgmental. And I'm not going to go through this entire list, because I'd rather focus much more on what counselling is. Um, and... <coughs> For donors and recipients, there's lots of different issues that need to, that can be explored, should be explored, need to be explored. Um, we have checklists which are very 
um, unhelpful, particularly when you're in a council situation. And I think my background is nursing and midwifery. I've done some counselling courses, but I'm not a counsellor. So I can help people to go to the counsellor, but the counsellor um, can take patients to a completely different place. And it is a relationship of trust, it's confidential, it's a safe place, it's where they can talk through different viewpoints, and I think for donors and recipients in particular, um, counselling really is key to the whole process. It, it needs to come early, early on, after they've had the information, then the counselling, and then a pause, and then move on. It's um, definitely one of the key things that we need to look at. Almost there, don't worry. Um, finally, within Europe, there's lots of different guidelines. And ESHRI has got a good practice guideline for cross-border reproduction. And it's really highlighted the things that we've spoken about today, about giving clear information about whether it's investigations, costs, waiting times, um, expected time patients have to spend outside the country. And that's something that patients do sometimes get caught out about, particularly when they're asked to go for egg recovery, um, for embryo transfer two days later. They have to be aware that they have to be looking at prices for flights, um, costs, and um, make sure they're prepared for, for any situation. Clinics should present. This is a slightly strange one. They should provide the name of the who complaints should be addressed to, and obviously within UK we have the HFEA. Um, but I would hope that in most waiting rooms there's uh, uh, information about who patients can um, contact with any complaints. The key to cross-border reproduction has to be communication and collaboration between the teams in the home country and the team abroad and boundaries as to who is giving the patient information and how that patient then deals with it. And also, as they have um, included evidence-based information and they quote the EU tissue directive. They also mention about disproportionate stimulation. Obviously, ovarian hyperstimulation is something that we really desperately want to avoid for both donors and patients and the number of embryos being transferred, but that, that's very clear. So really, the final slide, which I did not manage to do because I thought I was speaking at five o'clock, not 10 o'clock, <laughs> I would have put in that the take home message really is communication. Communication with the patient, communication with donors, with recipients, with the home clinics, um, information giving um, and informed consent being obtained and collaboration is the absolute key. And should anyone wish to be cross-border, then oh, do feel free to come to Scotland at any time. We do have some donors and recipients, and we've got beautiful hills. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I think coffee and I'm around all day and Katie's around all day and Alan's around all day and oh, Mo's around okay. all day. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to clarify, you showed a website there. Is that part of the HFE website? Yes. All that information is on the HFE website. If you go to the if you go to the beta It's on the beta website, you know the oh, new one? Yeah, yeah. It's actually quite find to ha hard to find the code of practice on the beta website, but you can find going abroad <laughs> information. Um, but how you actually get that information about clinics onto it, I don't know. Does anyone know? No? Something maybe for you to do, Ghazi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's something for you to do, but Tony's... So. Um, information on the HFE website about Crime Clinic. I wonder if it's driven by a patient. I don't know how that, a bit of a trip advisor. That slightly has shown, actually, it comes mm -hmm. from a, a, a website. Um, 
Well, that, when you go onto the HFA website, you click on Fertility Abroad, and that's the website that it must take you to then. Actually, Edward's uh, site is the Fertility Clinic, so he actually did contact me a few years ago from mm -hmm. my recipient guy uh, and asked if he were interested in advertising in his website for right. Fertility or actually for Health Pro, he does other things as well. And, and I said I wasn't interested at the time anyway. And somehow HFA is using, yeah. is using that website and I'm, they are obviously quite misled. So it's just one, uh, one it's eight, a yeah. of website that's all run by one person. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll take it back. Yeah. I have a feeling I just poked the <coughs> hornet's nest there, but. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So, um, if we can take a vote for those in favour of the motion, this House believes that investigating where current miscarriage is a waste of time and resources. For the motion, Thank you, uh, Peter, and thanks to Eva and Jill for asking me to open this debate today. I actually was given the choice of which side I would um, argue for. I'm not sure I chose the right side, but let's see. Aha, okay. Thank you, Martin. Yeah. Um, as a consultant, I run a recurrent miscarriage clinic for the last 25 years. Perhaps I should have reflected on my practice a little sooner. So what do we mean by a recurrent miscarriage? We mean by three confirmed miscarriages with the same partner. Um, it occurs in about one to three percent of all couples trying to conceive. So we look, look at statistics, that's around about 24,000 people in the UK. So it's quite a considerable um, size. I recognise having looked after these patients for the last 25 years, the amount of psychological stress, so I'm going to get even more stress now, um, uh, I hate using these PCs, the psychological distress associated with recurrent pregnancy, it's really high. And there is a real pressure to develop interventions that will improve the chance of a live birth. But what do we mean by investigating recurrent miscarriage? And uh, to, to go through this uh, for one time. What's the purpose of investigation, first of all? Surely that is to establish a, a diagnosis. Of course, um, this takes resources. There's not only the cost of performing the investigations, it costs around 70, uh, 720 pounds to investigate uh, a couple for recurrent miscarriage. It's time, time for the patient, which is often very precious, it takes time for the clinic, its resources. What are the likely findings? And are there treatments available to actually help once you've made that diagnosis? Does the knowledge of this make a difference to the outcome? I'm sure most in this room will be aware that the likely findings, if you're looking at the potential causes of um, uh, recurrent miscarriage, maternal age, Carry typical abnormalities, 
uterine abnormalities, thrombophilias, autoimmune conditions, endocrine conditions, and in, in infection. <coughs> These have all been put forward as potential causes of recurrent miscarriage. But of course, investigating takes time, and I'm not sure you're aware of this information, that you know the old wives' tale and you've got to wait at least three months before you start trying again. It's a load of balderdash. You need to get on with it, because if you delay, you're likely to have a reduced chance of um, uh, having a healthy live birth. So you need to get on and, and start trying for a baby within six months. You want to keep the interpregnancy interval low. We know the epidemiological factors. I don't need to tell you how to suck eggs. You know that as you get older, that you have an increased risk of having an abnormal fetus. And this is the miscarriage rates as age increases. And the reason why miscarriage rates increase with age is not because of the uterus. It's because of the age of the egg. And the slide on the right is the karyotypical um, abnormalities in blastocyst embryos with age. And so by the age of 44, over 80% of your embryos are abnormal. They're aneuploid. And that's and nothing that you can do about that. So what about if you've got a carrier typical abnormality? The instance is about three, or four, uh, uh, three to four percent. You can either have reciprocal translocations or Robertsonian translocations, you can have pericentric inversions or a paracentric inversion. What happens if you just continue to try naturally? These are a, a, a group of women who were prospectively followed. Um, they'd all had three or more miscarriages, 247, 83% of them had a further healthy live birth on their own without any intervention. Sure, there were some further miscarriages and 49% of them had at least one miscarriage. And there were a couple of unbalanced um, uh, babies born and two were picked up on um, early um, uh, diagnosis, on um, prenatal diagnosis. So the risk of having an abnormal baby is there, and one would um, suggest that you have prenatal diagnosis. But 83% of couples conceived on their own. So what about an intervention? What do we do if we think about using PGD to try and overcome that abnormality? The overall conception rate, only 33%. So we're going to spend £9,000 treating somebody for only a fraction of the um, pregnancy rate and live birth rate. So the reproductive outcome after PGD, these are conclusions of a, a, a very good, and I would recommend you read it, human reproduction update. Currently there's insufficient data indicating that PGD improves the live birth rate in couples with recurrent miscarriage carrying a structural chromosome abnormality. What about uterine abnormalities? Sure enough, recurrent pregnancy loss, a, a, a, an abnormal uterus is more prevalent, 12.6%, compared to the general infertile population at 3.4%, um, and um, fertile women at 4.3%. So it is more prevalent. These are sort of types of disorder that we have. We have a, a unicornic uterus, which is not that common. Um, you've got bicornic uterus in around 25%. Septate uterus, the, probably the most common at 35%, and archaic uterus in, six, in 20%. Undoubtedly, there is, it would seem, a reduced chance of conception and live birth and an increased risk of preterm birth with the uterine abnormality. I would accept that. But what about intervention? to make a difference. Does it really make a distance, difference to the outcome? This is a Cochrane review of the available evidence. No randomized control studies have been identified which assess the effectiveness of operative resections. We're gonna put our patients through an operation, we all do it, without any evidence, hard evidence, that it actually works. It seems to work, there's some rather biased studies, but none of them have been randomized. And of course, you're putting your, your patient through an operation with an anesthetic, with the risk of complications, 
without the evidence base on which to back that up. What about inherited thrombophilias? They are more prevalent in patients with recurrent miscarriage. Um, factor 5 lipin 1.9, prothrombin 2.7, anticardiolipin antibodies 5.1. There's an awful lot of things we test for there where there isn't any strong evidence um, that they're increased in patients with recurrent miscarriage. What happens if you don't treat? Do they get pregnant with antiphospholipid antibodies up to, in some studies, up to 50% live birth rates, inherited thrombophilias up to 75% live birth rates without any treatment. What about the diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? That's also been brought into question because of the timing of the tests and the accuracy of those tests. A century of equivocal evidence. Does it make a difference? Again, this is a review of all the available evidence. There are large gaps in knowledge and a lack of evidence for the treatment of women with pregnancy loss with thrombophilia. And really, with an inherited thrombophilia, there is no real evidence of benefit. The evidence of benefit in those with the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is based on some relatively small trials. You're talking about patients, about 50 patients. They're small studies, not large studies. We need to have more evidence available. So what do our RCOG say about the investigation and treatment of couples with recurrent first trimester miscarriage? What about endocrine, uh, endocrine factors? We know that an untreated diabetic has an increased risk of fetal abnormality in miscarriage. We also know that patients with thyroid antibodies purportedly have uh, an increased risk of um, miscarriage. But the, the actual prevalence of diabetes and thyroid dysfunction when was with recurrent miscarriage is similar to that of the general population. We know that women who have recurrent miscarriage have a, an increased prevalence of PCOS, 40% compared to 20% in the general population. And there's some recent evidence suggests that insulin resistance is increased in women with recurrent miscarriage compared to fertile match controls. But as yet, we have no evidence that treatment is worthwhile. Any severe infection that leads to bacteremia or viremia can cause sporadic miscarriage. However, there is no hard evidence to suggest the role of infection in recurrent miscarriage. We don't have an evidence base. Yet we've all done torch screens for years looking to see if um, they had an infection. Indeed, there's an awful lot of ineffective treatments in our guideline. So in fact, there are nine ineffective treatments in the recurrent miscarriage guideline from the RCOG. Um, looking at corticosteroids or immunoglobulin uh, with antiphospholipid antibodies, PGD, uh, insufficient evidence suggested um, uh, removing the uterine septum, <coughs> Roller progesterone, no evidence. In, um, HCG, no evidence. Suppressing LH in patients with PCO, no evidence. Uh, Roller metformin, no evidence. Um, something else that used to happen, paternal cell immunization, um, donor lu uh, uh, uh, leukocytes, no evidence. And um, uh, again, uh, insufficient evidence to use heparin in those with inherited thrombophilias. So most effective treatment with unexplained recurrent miscarriage with an excellent prognosis for future pregnancy outcome is to do nothing. Support care, tender loving care, TLC, in a dedicated session that people can actually help and support these patients. What we need is some blue sky thinking we need to do the research. If we invested the £720 used to investigate infertile couples per head, that equates to about £17 million. If we put that into research, we might actually find something which is useful, which may benefit. We know that if by doing research, there are um, uh, Issues with gene defects that may cause problems with angiogenesis and, uh, and uh, placentation. 
We don't know whether they actually are absolute, and if you've got these gene defects, you will not be able to carry a further pregnancy, but only further research will identify these. So in summary, in support of this motion, I hope I've convinced you enough to um, support the motion. This House believes that investigating recurrent miscarriage is a waste of time and resources. It's a waste of time. By delaying doing the investigations, you are reducing the chances of your patients having a spontaneous pregnancy. That establishing a diagnosis, what's the point of that when there's little evidence of effective treatment? Are we not just giving false hope to our patients? Ha, take this medication, take that medication. It, we know it doesn't work. It's a waste of resources. <coughs> Spending money on treatments that don't work, that aren't proven, is a waste of resources and time. Thank you for your attention. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. So, uh, first off, I'd like to thank um, Ebel and Jill for inviting me. It wasn't Jill that invited me, we just heard a little bit more about that later. Um, to come speak today, and also to Crown Abbey for their fantastic hospitality. Once again, much appreciated. Thanks very much. As I mentioned before, it was actually Tony that. Uh, invited me to speak today, and as he's done before, he uh, made sure that I was to stand in speaking with 10 days notice. <laughs> uh, but that's, a, that's a really subtle ploy to um, weigh, the, weigh the odds in his favour, so I thought I'd fight back a little bit with this, and I thought, well, I don't know who's going to vote against the guy in a wheelchair. <laughs> and if compassion doesn't work, but I'd probably got some more forceful ways to <laughs> But actually, to get serious about this, I do feel very strongly, and I'm glad that Tony did ask me to speak against this motion, because I do feel very strongly that recurrent miscarriage is a very significant medical condition which causes a lot of emotional stress and psychological problems for women. Unfortunately, as Tony has pointed out, miscarriage is not an uncommon event. About 15 to 20 percent of pregnancies will result in a clinically recognised pregnancy. By clinically recognised, I mean a pregnancy that's been diagnosed either histologically or ultrasound findings. If you include chemical or biochemical pregnancies, as we call them, the incidence is probably even higher than that. The majority of these pregnancies are obviously sporadic events, probably caused by genetic abnormalities within the egg. Now, fortunately, recurrent miscarriage is a less common event. We think it probably affects around 5% if you have two consecutive pregnancy losses and 1% if you have three consecutive pregnancy losses. However, the chances of the next pregnancy progressing normally once you've had a miscarriage is affected. After one miscarriage, there's a 15% chance that the next pregnancy will miscarry. After two, that increases to about 17 to 31%. And after three, as you can see, that affects up to 46% of pregnancies. This is not an inconsiderable problem. And it does cause a lot of psychological morbidity and emotional distress. I'm sure we've all seen couples in the clinic who suffer with recurrent miscarriage. And this has been estimated by a seminal paper by Ryan Regan, published in The Lancet in 2006, which found that up to a third of women attending a specialist recurrent miscarriage clinic were clinically depressed. And one in five exhibited levels of anxiety that were similar to women attending an outpatient psychiatric clinic. So we're talking about very considerable psychological and psychiatric morbidity here. And that morbidity isn't the only link between recurrent miscarriage and subfertility. If we look at the size of the problem, we've said before that 5% of couples will suffer two miscarriages. Now this is interesting because the American Society of Reproductive Medicine actually define recurrent miscarriages as two consecutive pregnancy losses, not three, because of the size of the problem, because of the risk of the next pregnancy miscarrying as well. And if you think about it, if you're in a fortunate situation, as I am, where you have patients who are eligible for NHS treatment, who have been funded for three cycles of treatment, and have miscarried in their first two, then are we not going to investigate before we put them through a third cycle of treatment? So I do think there is an argument in favour of investigating early in certain circumstances. 
As Tony has pointed out, there's also a significant effect of age on the increase in risk of recurrent miscarriage. Also, when we do investigate, we will find there's quite a high proportion of patients who fall into the unexplained category where we haven't picked up any abnormal results. But in its own way, that gives us more information. We certainly don't recommend not investigating patients for infertility problems. So why should we not investigate patients with recurrent miscarriage problems? I'm not the only one that thinks like this. I know Tony's already mentioned about the so-called Green Top Guideline published by our, our own Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. But the American Society for Reproductive Medicine has also published guidelines on the evaluation and treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss. I noticed when Tony presented his findings, he did concentrate on the negative aspects and glossed over anything that was remotely positive. Hopefully I'll try and address the balance. So what tests are we going to do? We really need to be looking for conditions where we think some form of intervention is going to help. Okay? We can think about hematological tests, the antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, we need to be specific about what we're looking for here. And we need to be looking for antiphospholipid antibodies that are tested for in a standardized test. They're found to be in a significant TETA, and they are positive on two occasions at least 12 weeks apart. But the only antiphospholipid antibodies that have a standardized test available for them, and they're the only ones that I would recommend, are lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibodies, and anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies. All of the others, there's no standardized tests, so the results you get from different laboratories won't equate. In terms of genetic testing, I agree with Tony that 2 to 5% of cases of recurrent miscarriage have a structural chromosomal abnormality, but I'm not advocating blanket screening. What the Green Top Guideline is recommending is being more specific in which patients you're offering karyotyping to. And that should be the patients who have had their products of conception carried out after three or more, more miscarriages and have been shown to have a, an unbalanced structural chromosomal abnormality. Finally, after 96 hours of function, we check the cluster system volume again to determine what is the proportion of expanded cluster system and hatching cluster. This is really important. Then you see uh, the report of an essay that we get, for example, certificate analysis, uh, certificate analysis. You can see that it is stable, the last development is over 80% or something. That doesn't really mean much because here we, are, we should be talking about the quality of the glasses, not the number, not the proportion. So we really have to be very careful what we are talking about. And we have to, this is very important. We have to also count the number of cells, specifically the number of ICM cells. This is really the fact that when you, your ICM numbers are down, this is going to certainly affect the implantation rate, and more importantly, it will affect people developing. So we have to count the cells. Here is a picture of uh, a blastus stain with a, a specific antibody, CDX group. This is a transcription factor expressed only in proper cells. ICM cells do not express the CDX group. So you can see that cells stained red here are proper cells. And then here you can see uh, some missing points where cells are not stated. This is uh, the curve ICM cells are. Then you can see that when you stain this area with a nuclear uh, stain ducking, you can see, you see that all cells are stable. Then you merge these two pictures. Here you can clearly see professional cells are red and ICM cells are blue. Uh, so this has to be used. And sometimes for some items like HSC, like oil or, or that you are using for your culture, these are really very critical particles. And that has to be checked sometimes. You want to see what is the effect of these items on embryo viability. And you have to do embryo transfer, like we were discussing. But we can do all of this and make sure that all items are not embryo. But we still would like mouse embryo essay 
doesn't tell you and doesn't guarantee that the item you are testing is not toxic for the human embryo. It gives an indication, but it doesn't tell you exactly. This is why we have to also monitor some parameters that are very critical for our subject, like implantation, clinical pressure, and you can extend this, like by birth. We have to monitor all of them. This is, for example, this is an example of the clinical pregnancy rate we obtained uh, between August 2016 and January 2016. Here is a mean of clinical pregnancy rate. And we have plus and minus two standard deviations. These are upper uh, warning unit and uh, this is lower warning unit and plus and minus two standard deviation. This is, I'm sorry, this is control. Uh, yeah, these are the control uh, uh, points. Plus and minus three standard deviation. Here you can see that uh, our clinical pregnancy rate, which was around seven some percent was almost very stable really. It didn't change much. But something happened in December 2016. And it went up again to normal short period. It is only to observe these kinds of charts in the world. You can then start asking, well, what's happening? Is it the patient profile that has changed? Is it the air quality? Or is it the embryo development? That have we changed the medium? Have we changed the batch of the medium that we are using? So these are the critical questions that we can answer only by analyzing these kind of data. Well, this is great, really. We can actually, we have to monitor these kinds. But it's kind of after the fact, isn't it? Because when you know that your clinical pregnancy rate is not going well, it's, I mean, a lot of damage is already done. So we have to establish some key performance indicators as an early warning system, such as fertilization rate, or number of normal fertilizers or sites that complete the first cell division by 26 hours or Or the proportion of four cell embryos on day two. Or the proportion of good quality clusters on day five. There, there is no rule stating that, you know, if you keep one of these parameters, you are fine. The task for every IVF laboratory is to establish a good correlation between one of these and by birth rate or clinical pregnancy. We have to do this. There is not a single solution. So everybody has to optimize that. Well, if quality management system is such a good thing, why not every laboratory is interested? This is really, a, at least as far as Turkey is concerned, it's a significant issue that I think we have to manage. First of all, to be able to establish a quality management system, you have to have sufficient and appropriate human and, uh, and at the same time financial resources. Uh, you have to have, you have to be committed and uh, support, we have to get support from the venture. Uh, but sometimes, uh, you can see this, you know, an IDF manager, a laboratory manager, I mean, a director, uh, would want to start a quality management program, initiate the procedure, and then if, uh, he or she doesn't continue, so, uh, uh, if she, he or she is not committed to this, Cannot get the result. Another important issue is that whenever you do something different in the lab, you start seeing some resistance change. 
is sometimes happens directly or sometimes indirectly. This is why when you want to exchange something, you would like to have all the individuals involved uh, uh, are on board. They understand the change and support the change. Otherwise, uh, the success will be limited. I also would like to mention uh, toxic workplace. What do we mean by this? Well, you can have full communication between coworkers, which is essential. You have to have good communication. Everybody involved in this. Lack of reward or recognition. This is another problem sometimes. Same time, lack of accountability. All finding on the data. These are the kind of behaviors that we face implementing the quality management system. Uh, I'd like to finalize my talk with uh, some results that preliminary uh, results, I should say, uh, from our system. About a year ago, Dr. Tekin asked me whether or not it would be possible to develop our own unit. I knew that it is not an easy task. But since we have a good animal laboratory, we can culture and use a test surface, I decided uh, we can give it a try. With that, we you know, purchased the necessary equipment and all the chemicals and etc. and we started working. This is a picture that I got from. Uh, our culture. These are day five uh, ambient industries. So you can see. I named this uh, crown idea. And this is a, when we were doing all these experiments, we were doing it at the same time with a commercial. Uh, actually, I don't want to name, I don't want to name the media, but it's a very popular and uh, commonly used uh, idea. So they were being always in front. Today, we cultured almost 200, around 250 ambulance for each uh, unit. Here you can see uh, ambulance development score. With the commercial media that we were using, we get around 59% of ambulance and compacted ambulance on the field compared to 65 with the media we produce. What is the proportion of day for the after? 39 and 40. What is the proportion of lastus expanded, hatched, and hatched lastus? You can see 69% lastus. Yeah, I know this. And it is evident from my talk also that this doesn't mean anything. By just looking at this thing, you cannot say, okay, great, crown idea and the people is doing great compared to commercial. That, that doesn't mean that. To be able to say something about this, we had to do embryo Now I'm going to share with you some of the data. Today, we transferred around 30 embryos in each group using six pseudopregnant mice. Here I also would like to point out that, you know, in mice, there are two corneal uterus. The uterus has two corneas, left and right. So when we are doing the uh, transfer, we always transfer, let's say, one, uh, one group of embryos to the left side, and the other group we transfer to the right side. That way, you try to get rid of the variation that would come from the uh, mother. And we transferred five philosophies per day for. And let's look at the implantation. It's about the same. I mean, it's a little bit high. I didn't do statistical tests for this uh, because we would like to do more experiments, of course. We have to do 
more purposes. But we can see that the implantation is duplicate, the crown identity, the implanted security is actually better than the conversion. Then you look at the, you know, how many implants do you get per detailing part? Again, they are very similar. 4.8 and that's just 4. And the range is 4 to 5 to 3 to 5. What about the resorption size? What, are, what is the proportion of embryos or babies that die after the transfer? You know, these are the embryos that are implanted but die for some reason that we don't know. Uh, 13.3 percent versus 23 percent. I don't think if, if this is you know, different, but I, I, as I indicated earlier, I didn't do statistical test on it, so I, I cannot say for sure that you know, this is definitely. But uh, it looks like they are different. Well, let's look at the living group for elastosis trunk. It is 82% in our media compared to 66.7%. Then you count the uh, number of mean differences per implantation site. Again, you see some difference 86.2%, 70.8%. But we can you know, continue with this, but um, just to assess the viability of the future. And we also have to measure the rate of fetus on day 18 of pregnancy. And we can see it. Uh, with the crown IVF, it's a little bit lower, 0.746. And, uh, but I did a statistical t-test, failed to test it, but it is not significant. So it's about the same. Then you could ask. Uh, is there a need to develop our own media? Considering the fact that you know, we can easily get uh, media co uh, from, the, you know, we can buy certain media and use it for your culture. That's only the mouse and the test we can order. But I believe that we really have some good reasons to develop our own media. Because first of all, you are assuming that, you know, what you are getting is really the best. I don't think it is the case. First of all, we don't know the composition of the media. We don't know how stringent they are tested for embryo toxicity. And it seems ethically unacceptable. When I think about it, I don't know, you would uh, come up with a better number. I mean, how many IVF patients do we have in the world? For me, do you have a number? Millions, right? But all of these patients depend on only a few supplies. So we have to really think about it. I think there is really a need, as, at least yeah, as, as long as we are concerned. Uh, we don't know, the, you know how long this study, the world is starting to take us, but we need to be able to develop our own media if we want to. And I also wanted to mention, for, I forgot to mention that you know, all site and embryo uh, connection media that we use here uh, was also made by us. So it's not, it's a complete system. From all site connection until embryo connection. And uh, I would like to thank you for your patience, and that's all I want to say. Thank you so much. Um, to give due acknowledgement, I am just one 
part of a huge team. Um, the story goes that um, we in Sheffield applied for the money and they thought our immunity medicine was good but our epidemiology was poor. Um, our colleagues in Manchester um, applied for some money and their epidemiology was strong but their reproductive medicine was poor and any good politician knows the solution to that is just to ask the two teams to work together so that's how that kind of came apart. And effectively we kind of devised the protocol and then worked pretty independently and that gives the study some particular power because it means that all of the epidemiological um, analyses was done blind to the semen quality data and all the semen quality data was done blind to the epidemiological analysis and it was it was probably seven or eight years after we started that the two sets of data went together. So it does give us some strength by the fact that there are two separate teams uh, working on this study. The protocol is very straightforward, um, a bit, bit long-winded and elaborate. We, we wanted to recruit every new male patient attending one of 12 hospitals in the UK for fertility investigations. They had to be 18 years or more and be trying uh, to conceive with their partner for 12 months or more. And what was critical about the whole thing was the fact that they never previously had a semen analysis, and that was to try and deal with the issue of bias. If you ask a man with poor semen quality um, what his lifestyle is like, he's likely to, or we were worried that he was going to over egg some of his risks. So we, we wanted to do the interviews blind uh, to out uh, They had to be fluent in English, we didn't have money for translation services, and that is a bias because what I'm going to say relates to really. Uh, we excluded anybody that we thought was, uh, well, when there was a known reason for uh, poor semen quality system fibrosis, previous cancer treatment, previous vasectomy, and then we uh, set off with our recruitment. The centres were chosen kind of deliberately to cover the, the UK, a good mix of urban and rural centres um, uh, up and down the country. We didn't get every centre on board that we wanted. I mean, this predates. NHIR and the whole kind of multi-centre trial thing in the UK, so we were kind of predating a lot of the, um, the current networks that existed. Uh, we were grateful to what was probably 300 people across all the centres that helped, uh, helped us do that. Now you might say, um, why study, if you're looking at risks, why study men that are going to an infertility clinic, why not just study men in the general population? And there was a study funded in the round that we um, got the money in that did look at the general population in Scotland. It's never reported, it's never published its data uh, for various reasons, uh, but studies of the general population are just really, really, really difficult to do. They've got their own biases. Uh, our thinking was that if there are risks out there, and at the time that we did this study we thought there would be many, if there are risks you're more likely surely to see them in men attending a fertility clinic because that's why they're in the clinic they're exposed to something that's causing their sperm quality to be poor. Uh, and we had a way of kind of controlling for that, which I will uh, explain as we go along. Now, importantly, the design of the study, it was the epidemiological design was strong. It was called a case reference classification. And so you basically take all your population and then you divide them into two. You either divide them as a case, and we designed our case classification as men with less than 12 million motile sperm. That was an arbitrary figure, it linked back to the previous data, it wasn't based on biology. Um, the reference population was people with uh, 12 million motile sperm or more. And uh, basically, to cut a long story short, if there's a risk for poor sperm quality, you're going to see more of it in the left hand group than you are in the right hand group. If an exposure, if a lifestyle behaviour, if a thing, um, is equally distributed between the two groups, then it's not a risk, it can't be. So that's the, that's the premise of the epidemiological design. And that allows you to calculate an odds ratio. I'm sure you all know about odds ratios, but here's a, um, a, a quick summary. So if an odds ratio um, crosses, is on one, or the 95% confidence it crosses one, then it's not significant. But if it's to the right of one, then we're seeing evidence of harm. If it's to the left of one, seeing evidence of benefit. We should be open to the fact that some of these guys may actually be doing things that are of benefit. They may read the Daily Mail and do whatever. So we should be open to, to, to benefits uh, as well as risks, although the government were being funded to find risks. So um, we published our first paper on 
uh, that's in the main paper from this study in 2008. We've published it in quite a um, obscure is probably the wrong word. We published it in an occupational medicine uh, paper. And to cut a long story short, um, having looked at nearly two and a half thousand men, of which 2,118 were in employment, uh, we looked at all the occupational risks. We had about 30 different occupational questionnaires that men could answer, looking at lifetime exposure to certain things, such as lead or exposures in the previous three months, in the case of other things. And to our surprise, after we'd adjusted for everything else, we only found one risk. And the risk, the occupational risk that we found, uh, that was more prevalent in our case group, was uh, men who were working with organic solvents in the three months prior to semen analysis. And they had an increased probability of being in the case group as a consequence of that exposure. Now let me decode what that means. Glycol ethers are things that used to be present in paints, glues, printing inks, dry cleaning fluids. You kind of go into a, oh, I don't know, a building where somebody's been painting and you, you know, the solvent smell. Glycol ethers are present in, in that or, or were. And actually this was a surprise because for a number of reasons. One, um, the risk was already known, and the paint and glues and printing inks industry had already, were already trying to remove these compounds from the supply chain. So the fact that we saw it still was interesting and suggests it's still out there as a risk. But two, it was a surprise because we didn't find anything else. Risks like driving long distances, which has been reported in other studies, came close to being significant wasn't significant in our study. That could be a function of power, although I doubt it because of the size of the men that we have and the commonness of that occupation. So occupationally, um, everybody was very happy. Part of our funding came from the Health and Safety Executive Department of Health Department of the Environment. And I remember going to a big meeting in one of the government buildings in London, quite close to the, um, to the Shakespearean theatre on the bank of the uh, of the Thames, and I remember going to this meeting and presenting this data, and it was a real, real don't put this on the internet for God's sake, whoever's recording me, but it was a really interesting experience because they just sat there and they folded their arms and they went, well done, this is fantastic, <coughs> because they realised at that point that they weren't going to be sued, because we hadn't found any risks, and we kind of went, can you give us some more money to do some more experiments, and they went, no. <laughs> So we kind of left on a high, but on a low, and everything kind of stopped there. And we all went off and did our separate things. And then time passes. This is where I'm a hedgehog and not a fox, because I didn't spot this. Okay. So over the next few years, I was getting increasingly frustrated with the kind of Daily Mail reporting of all of these potential risks to male fertility. Many of them based on studies that were out there and some were good, some were bad. But I'm, you know, if I was a patient, I would be bloody confused at all this. And I wouldn't know what to do. Should I be eating bacon? Should I be eating walnuts? I got an email about the walnuts study. A guy emailed me and he said, well, I've been out and bought some walnuts. What the hell do I do with them during sex? <laughs> <laughs> Sense of this. The best headline I've ever seen is this one, though. Um, any excuse to not do the housework. Um, sorry, darling, I can't do the vacuuming, it might damage my skin. Um, a study that apparently claimed that the level of electromagnetic radiation from a domestic vacuum cleaner was sufficient to compromise the function. What a load of our problems. So, um, what I hadn't realised was that we were sitting on a gold mine because we had all this data. We'd asked all these questions. We just, because we were so focused on occupational risk, we'd never thought to go back to the data and look at all the lifestyle risks. We'd used all the lifestyle data in the occupational paper as, a con as confounding factors that we controlled for, but we'd never thought about using them as a primary variable. So I was sitting next to a, a, one of our study team at a meeting and I just nudged the guy, the guy and I said, we're sitting on a gold mine here. 
we need to go back into the day. So, what do we think we know about lifestyle and, and uh, seeing quality? Well, at the time, this was before the most recent incarnation of the NICE guidance, we had this document, which some of you may recognise. What does it say about what doctors should tell patients or advise patients about their sperm quality? Well, it says the following. <coughs> it says that doctors should advise about the dangers of cigarette smoking, should advise about the dangers of alcohol consumption, should advise about the dangers of wearing tight underwear, should advise about being too fat, should advise about the detrimental effects of recreational drug use, and should advise about danger occupations. All right, well, we've done occupations, there's not that many risks. But the rest of it is what um, should be said. So, some questions for you. Play along. If you've heard this talk before, still play along. Think about your current practice. If you're not a doctor, think about what you would do if you were a doctor. Who would advise a male partner who smokes cigarettes to stop in order to enhance their sperm quality? Any takers for that? A few. Would you advise a male partner to stop drinking alcohol or cut down on his consumption? A bit a few more. Would you advise a male partner who wore tight underwear to switch to boxer shorts? Julian. No, a few more, Julian. <laughs> but fewer than smoking or alcohol. Where are you? Would you advise a male partner with a high BMI to lose weight? A few of you? Who would advise a male partner who took recreational drugs to stop? More of you. And. Would anybody inform a male partner about danger occupations? No, well, there aren't that many, so you're right. So, think about your answers. What's the evidence base of the NICE guidance? It's actually pretty crap. It's full of studies like this. Uh, I'm not picking on these particularly, but two and a half thousand men, sp semen, blood sampling, smokers had a 19% reduction in sperm concentration, many endocrine changes related to smoking. I get that. Another study, 51 smokers, 57 non-smokers, tested <coughs> the time using the carbon monoxide detector, looked at DNA damage, couldn't see any difference in the traditional superparameters, but saw that the sperm of smokers had more DNA problems than those non-smokers. Kind of been given that one actually, from what we know. So, but a small study, previous one the big study, I'm not quite sure. Um, alcohol. Here's someone on the terrace last night. <laughs> sure, I saw him. 66 non smokers compared to 30 <coughs> alcoholics. Major endocrine disruption of being a heavy drinker. And most semen parameters were pretty, were pretty altered as a consequence. Here's the data alcoholics versus controls. Some significant differences. But if I was a patient and I had a sperm count of 51 million quid and I was taking a skin full every day, I wouldn't actually be that bothered, because it's still normal. These are statistical differences from normal to normal, and that's often what you see. You see statistical differences that are reported, but they're normal to normal. So I think it's really difficult to make sense of some of this data, and I think the NICE guidance to some extent has made a bit of a, um, a rubbish job at synthesizing the literature. So what can we do? Well, we've got all this data. We didn't realize it, as I said. So we went back to the data, and we decided to take a look. Same classification, no different, except we can include more of the men because although some of the guys weren't working, everybody has a lifestyle. So we can include more of the data, we can include the whole lot. So we published this in 2012, 2,249 men, 939 cases. We were relying on self-reported measures. Um, we did ask some medical issues uh, that you'll see in a moment, and we didn't go back to medical notes, so maybe that is a weakness, but I think most people can remember the basics. Um, and interestingly, in terms of the design, um, bad recall is not a problem, because the fact that we asked them before they knew their semen analysis meant that you can get that reporting in equal numbers between the two groups. That reduces power, it doesn't impose bias. So, I'll take you through the data because it's quite interesting. You do univariate analysis first of all, age, no effect, ethnic group, <coughs> more likely to be a case if you're a black ethnicity, 
really can't explain it, we weren't expecting that. But you were less likely to be the case if you had a previous conception, if you fathered a child previously. Perhaps not surprising, if you've done it once, you can do it again. But if men reported that they previously had testicular surgery, and what we're thinking there are things like um, surgery for undescended testicles, surgery for hypospadias, things like that, not vasectomy, they were excluded, um, then you were more likely to be a case. Uh, pelvic imaging, if a man had had an x-ray to his pelvis, he was more likely to be a case. It's interesting the number of men in our questionnaire who didn't understand what their pelvis was, but we kind of got around that in our analysis. <laughs> Interestingly, men who'd had mumps post-pubertally above the age of 13, an arbitrary line that we drew, it kind of works, uh, were more likely to be a case. If a man had had a fever in the previous three months, lasting more than two weeks, this isn't going to bed, taking parasite, and waking up fine the next morning, this is proper fever, rigorous, proper flu, uh, then they were more likely to be a case. We checked for age of partner, there was no effect. Um, these are things that are, they were non-modifiable factors, they were things that you couldn't change as an individual, but these are things that potentially could be changed. BMI, no effect, couldn't see anything. Kind of surprising, wasn't expecting that. Um, but, if you were a manual worker, or you were not working, you were more likely to be a case. Now, until recently, I didn't understand the not working category. But there is now increasing data around men with sedentary lifestyles having poor receiving quality. Uh, and that's now, uh, I think, becoming far more uh, respected. Uh, but manual working, you were more likely to be a case, potentially because you were in that group exposed to the rifle ethers that we found in our other study. But interestingly, and not many of you voted for this. Um, the boxer shorts wear wearers were not were less likely to be a case. They were more likely to have better sperm quality, and that surprised us. I was a bit of a cynic of the old tight pants theory until we saw this data. But there it is. Um, if, you wore, if you wore box shorts, loose pants, more likely to be a case. Therefore, if you wore tight pants, if we'd done the analysis the other way around, you can uh, see that tight pants were a risk. Alcohol consumption. Now, all those people who put their hand up said they would advise against drinking. Look at the green. <laughs> Men who drunk alcohol in the previous three months were more likely to have better sperm quality. I have a theory about that, but I can't prove it. If you buy me a drink later tonight. I'll say <laughs> but if you were a smoker, the previous three months, no effect on your motile concentration. Not what the nice guy would say, not what some of you say when you were looking at the DNA. Now, I caution that with, we know that smoking damages sperm DNA, and we didn't use that as our dependent variable, so I suspect that um, that is still good sound advice. But street drugs, no effect. And cannabis use specifically, no effect. Hold that thought, we're going to come back to street drugs in a moment. You're not recording this bit, are you? Don't use this. Say. No. Because, oh, no, you can use this bit, and then I'm going to tell you a story. Um, so, what you then do is you take all of the univariates, and you shove them in a model, and you cross control for everything else, and you come up with the final model. This is the final model. Ethnicity is a risk, testicular surgery is a risk, manual work is a risk, boxer shorts are a benefit, previous conception is a benefit. Mumps has disappeared from our analysis as a risk factor. That might be power related, I don't know. But these are the risks in the UK population of 2,500 men uh, from about uh, 15 years ago. Remember, this is historic data. There are things we didn't ask about. We didn't ask about mobile phones, we didn't ask about laptops, we didn't ask about vaping. I can't answer those questions. But what I think it shows you is when you do a rigorous analysis, you are knocking out things that we think or we're told from us are important risks, at least in terms of motor concentration. For alcohol consumption, we looked at dose. You can't put this on the internet for God's sake, because our statistician absolutely took a rap over this, and she was Irish. When we got to this analysis, it's any alcohol consumption, regardless of dose. And she looked across the table at us and she said, I oh, think that's, you never trust a man that doesn't know what you're doing. So it's any alcohol. 
So, I think we need to rethink our advice, quite frankly. And I think probably <coughs> the only thing that you could advise a man to improve his motile concentration is to change his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell this guy the religion. <laughs> so, um, I think nicely to take a look at this. But what I've done is told you about motile concentration. Clearly there's more to it. What about morphology? We have all the slides. So we redid the analysis using the now new WHO classification of normal 4%, whether you believe it or not, so it doesn't matter. But it is evidence-based at least, so we've got to stab in the dark. But what's interesting about this, I don't know What's interesting about this is, think about it, I think that the processes in the testis that lead to sperm production are quite separate from the processes that lead to how the cell is packaged. I think there are very different <coughs> processes, I'm sure there are very, very different genetic pathways. So I think looking at morphology as an independent variable is quite useful. And when we did that, um, using the same approach, um, we found that uh, fever was a risk factor for poor morphology, high fever, um, lower morphology, and then in terms of modifiable characteristics, this is where street drugs and cannabis do make an appearance. Uh, season also makes an appearance, and abstinence makes an appearance in a way that we don't understand. You shovel that data into a model, and you come out with a single model to define the risk factors for poor morphology, and that's what we get. You get poorer morphology in summer, you get poorer morphology in cannabis users. We have to interpret cannabis use with caution because cannabis use correlates positively with every other drug use. So it is a surrogate marker for recreational drug use. It may not be the cannabis per se, it just may be the fact that this person is taking something. And we don't have the ability to look at that in detail. Having said that, knowing about the action of the active substances in cannabis, I wouldn't be surprised if it is cannabis that is causing the cause of morphology. And abstinence makes an appearance in a way that we can't explain in that morphology was getting worse with longer, uh, getting better with longer abstinence, but it kind of doesn't make sense. But it's in the model, we have to report it. And then what you can do, and I don't talk about this bit very much because it gets really complicated, but now you can combine the two data sets and you can say what are the risk factors for having low motile concentration and all poor morphology. And we've only done that so far for the occupational factors. But what's interesting when you do that is more occupational risks come out. So two things that do come out of that is um, exposure to paint strippers. I have to say, I don't know what is in paint strippers, but paint strippers seems to be a risk. And uh, lifetime exposure to lead, and that is a lifetime exposure to organic lead, you never get rid of it. So it's not a three-monthly exposure. So I think there's probably a greater finesse of the data than we've done so far to be done combined morphology and um, motile concentration together in the model. Although I have to say I'm not sure I've got the energy to go through all this again in this kind of a way. So we'll have to see whether we do do it in the lifestyle. So in summary, um, I think the only risks we can be certain of, at least in the UK population, is the organic solvent one. That should technically have gone now, but I, I do worry about whether or not it's still in the workplace. There are very few lifestyle factors. Um, cannabis is probably bad, uh, as is season, but what are you going to do? Are you going to tell somebody not to have their IVF because it's the summer? I mean, I don't think that the results are so, so significant that you should be advising patients in that way. Just be aware of the risk. But also, we, we are slightly more worried now about pain strippers and the lead. We've got more to do. We've been trying over the last year to do a whole dietary analysis. We've got food diaries of these guys. Um, and I have to say, more data than I've ever seen, and it's more complicated than I ever realised it would be. Um, but maybe one day we'll get a dietary analysis um, out of this data. Um, my dream is, if I'm honest with you, I would like to do it all again. Um, because um, <coughs> lifestyle has changed over the last 20 years. Um, there are things we didn't ask about and we should. And we've actually now got a baseline and a pretty comprehensive baseline of what semen quality was in Britain in the early noughties. And if we are worried that sperm counts have declined over the last 60 years, we're 
you're in a fairly unique position to go back using the same methodology in the same centres and asking the same questions to see whether or not that has shifted in the last 20 years. And if it has, then I'll change my mind and I'll start to worry about male reproductive risk hazards. If it hasn't, I think we'll be able to be in a unique position to answer a question that has been burning a handologist for, for many, many years. So some of you in this room may be getting phone calls and emails from me at some point um, because I need to get my head around how we get the money for this. Um, I was going to talk about potential interventional trial, um, but having heard Chris's talk about underpants sensors, and, um, I think I'm just going to sit back and think about that in a bit more detail before the decisions. I might be emailing you, Chris, about that. So thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Would you stick with the original parameters and would you include DNA fragmentation? 
I would include DNA fragments. Well, I, I would include some measure of DNA, but I don't know what measure of DNA to include. So, kind of what I'm hopeful is, is David Miller's um, trial will, I think, tell us, I hope, fingers crossed, which of the DNA measures is going to be useful. And I would, I would incorporate whatever that study said. I think that's the obvious thing to do. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because 20 years ago, we didn't even, we didn't even think on those terms. So, it would be an obvious addition. <coughs> is the damage with organic solvents permanent? I mean, if they come after three months, if they... I can't answer the, that question because we didn't do that. You'd have to do an RCT or you'd have to do a cross-sectional study to do that. My gut reaction is that it probably is reversible, but I can't prove it. And, and what's, it, what's interesting about that is, well, I'll take my theory now. I should get a drink out of this, but... Um, I think the reason that the drinkers are, in slight, in, are, are less likely to be in the hazard group is because if you're a drinker, your liver as an enzyme is slightly more in tune to metabolize alcohol. And actually, the metabolism of glycol ether is not so different enzymatically from the metabolism of alcohol. So I think that's how that group has benefit. So knowing the biology or the chemistry of glycol ether, I would suspect that it's a temporary I'm going to give you some feedback from our previous year. Um, I'm going to let you know about some changes that have been coming. Changes in coordination, coordination of Cyprus, and Anne, who works with Jill at Midland, has kind of given us a few words about how we all work together just so you can. Um, 
manage patients because they didn't have the pressure that they had on their own. And it generally helped. And it was something that we could have done to do. <coughs> we very proud of here is our QBJ accreditation. Um, and then what else we did from yesterday, she was saying about how things are more regulated. Um, it's happened in over 10 years. We've tried more and more to regulate the clinic, to uh, improve all our services. When the clinic first had QAJ inspection, they would do, they do everything, it just the documentation wasn't necessarily there. So QHA is a UK consultant and NHS managers. Um, it accredits hospitals all over the world. It's a two year inspection cycle. And the surveillance so inspectors ordered practice against the set standards. Um, they take their recommendations back to the accreditation board and the certificates awarded. What that does is it helps the clinic look at its own practices as well. So every time they have their inspection, um, they review things and make changes that not necessarily don't need to, but it helps them do their practice. And from a clinic point of view, from a primary care point of view, at my point of view, when I'm speaking to doctors, it's very, very reassuring to refer a clinician and patients a little bit. You know, it, it's a real minefield finding the fertility clinic abroad. So the fact that it's a standard and the UK referring clinician knows this is standard, it's very, very good. We get excellent feedback from Cyprus. Um, if we have any problems, it always seems to be. Um, some of it's patient expectations. I think they sometimes expect a little bit too much, like I'm going to start the plane and hold their hand and order a flight leave, and, and it's managing that. We, we get patients at the, very, at the end of a very, very long journey, and they're often quite angry, and they've often spent a lot of money, so it's a quite difficult patient to deal with. Um, so we've approved our paperwork, it's published to UK doctors, so I think we've got that. And feedback we get with the communication. During the process, there's times when things were quiet. They've picked their door and they've got the flight boot, and they just think, I haven't heard anything, I haven't heard anything. Um, so these were the areas we felt we needed to address. In 2017, we got um, a new clinic, um, which is opening soon. Uh, it's the same place as the original clinic, the old clinic. However, it's a brand new purpose-built clinic on four floors. Um, we're expanding the coordination team here in Cyprus, um, and we're helping with new areas. So I know that the feedback from the coordinators of deals in the UK was uh, they were struggling with patients asking about travel, where do I travel to, do I need a visa, things like that. So we've uh, taken that on board and have appointed Charlotte, who can, is an expert on travel in Cyprus. And we also do the recombine donor screening on all our donors now. Um, I was asked about this for patients a while ago, we went back to Dr. Tekins and taken that on board. This is our lovely new clinic. So it's not completely finished yet, but that's the building. We have four floors of it. And inside, just an example of that, it's going to be great to when the furniture's in, it's nice and light and airy. Um, patients have their own rooms, so there's a, a treatment floor, the patient room floor, and the reception floor. So the reception floor has the nurse offices on, the finance department, and then there's a um, treatment room to the back floor, and then the patients get taken to their own individual room, which I uh, help John and the furniture floor, it's lovely. It's very nice, light, warm furniture, very, very good. Lovely when it's finished, and that should be finished in the next few months. Still in pharmacos, but still in the same place. But when communication came in, what we devised ourselves and the coordinators in Cyprus was this good format that every patient now gets. So top bits and bloods, and then all the way down is the contact. So we contact them initially, we contact them before they start treatments, we contact them prior to travel, and when they're in Cyprus. You know, you know, all the way through, you can see it all down and it's got to be documented for each patient. We changed the brand 
around you, and then the travel vision. It doesn't seem that important, but to patients, it's a normal thing to worry about. Uh, they've got the support from me, they've got the support from their clinics, from the UK, but they're worried about the travel and transport and time. And my comment, I always say, patients, if they're easier, if they used to be easier, if they used to be you, I feel the better chance of this working. Less stress. <coughs> Patients who are stressed, but I, I keep saying it to Tony at home, if you get a really stressed patient who never has a phone, who doesn't understand the who just constantly, constantly worries about everything, and yet to be there, the one who doesn't work at home, would you agree? So what do you tell your patients now? <laughs>
are in all inclusive communication. Um, obviously, I've got myself in the UK. I also have Claire uh, in the UK as well, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, they've got that extra point of contact, that extra source of information. And they've also got Farhan and Jay in site messaging as well. Um, so they've got that constant uh, communication with either one of us. So um, it gives a lot of constant reassurance. Um, what I also love about this kind of here is that there is also, there's always a really clear plan in place. Like I said, from the start, we come up with a draft plan. Patients like that sort of paper copy, that, that information, what their step-by-step -step guide, and that is something that they get here as well. Um, and that is something which I think is, is absolutely brilliant. Something for them to follow, something for them to work to. Um, and again, that eases um, their anxieties. Um, I also feel that a good, I say, we develop a good trusting relationship. It comes back to communication again. Once we develop that really good trusting relationship with them, it reduces stress. And I've noticed since, and I can't say that Charlotte has been um, appointed, it really has made everything a lot um, easier. Um, again, as Claire was saying, a lot of patients, they were really coming to me or Claire with questions about where they could stay, transfer, so on and so forth. And it wasn't questions I could answer. Um, I'd be bouncing uh, back to Claire and then bounce back to Cyprus and it, it, it did become a little bit um, complicated but thankfully since Charles has been put in place it has made everything so much smoother, so much easier. That quiet phase has been made a lot easier for patients. Um, overall, um, I thoroughly enjoyed working in Cyprus and I've done it for a few years now and it is a, now a really smooth and easy process from start to finish and the patients who I see when they come back are absolutely thrilled um, and if you keep getting pregnant that would be lovely um, <laughs> as they keep bringing their babies back to see me which is absolutely wonderful so uh, thank you very much
each individual case is considered separately. There's no precedent set, and there is a chance that unless you can really justify the reason that the committee will turn it down. Um, so, um, you know, I think that, that that's the reason why they have made donors vote for the non-anonymous over here. So it's a, it's a bit silly, really, from an HFA point of view, and I think it's a bad from a patient point of view, so all we do is switch to a non-anonymous donor and then you just be transported. <coughs> If you come a little bit closer to each other, much better. Thank you. Thank you.
Yani Amerika'da ya da Avrupa'nın herhangi bir izni alabilecekleri tedavi burada da en iyi şekilde alabilecekleri gerekli bir gerekli Son zamanlarda Türkiye'de tıp alanında büyük gelişmeler Çalışmalar içerisinde ortak alışverişler yapıyoruz. 
her yıl teknoloji değişiyor, yeni yeni şeyler geliyor. Tabii biz de onlardan öğreniyoruz. Onlardan da öğreniyorlar. Bir paylaşım için yapıyoruz. Artılar. E, mutlaka bizim de çok büyük katkıları oluyor. Oluyoruz. Çok çalışıyoruz da. Bizim de paylaştılar. Biz de kendi çalışmamız yapmıştık. Öylelikle zaten yani bu e, bilimsel çalışma tarzı bu, bu şekilde paylaşmak. İşte çünkü şey olmuyor. Gizli saklı yapmak olmuyor. O zaman onlar da bilim olmuyor. Ve tabii bütün insanlığın faydası için bu gelişmeler olmuyor. Onda da her, her yıl daha ileri gidiyor. Yani her zaman e, doğru ve e, iyi iş yapan kazanıyor. Peki hastalığına da bahsediyoruz. Size gelen hastalığına da bahsediyoruz. Şimdi bizim Yıllar içerisinde tabi Kıbrıs'ta kankatajda bir sayısı arttı. Evet. Ee, biz uzun yıllar tek başımıza yaptık çok mutlaka hastalık. Şimdi hala yine aynı şekilde devam ediyor. Fakat işler daha zorlaştı. Şu anlamda zorlaştı. Çünkü rekabet çoğaldı. Tabii ki çok fiyat avantajı ve diğer avantajları sunarak rekabeti yapıyor diğer ülkede. Bu tabi biz daha çok karşıdık. Biz e, çok, yani son 10 senedir çok daha zor hastalarla uğraşmaya başladık. Tabii ki bizim bilgi ve bilgi birikimimiz, tecrübemiz geliştiği için... Nedir yaş ortalaması? Yani yaş... Ortalama yaş 45'tir bizim yerimizde. 45'ten aşağı olmuyor. Genelde 45'ten ortalama yaş. Maksimum yaş oranı. Şimdi bu maksimum yaş oranı piyasaya göre e, sınırsız. Sadece hastanın e, sağlığını tehdit eden bir sağlık sorunu olmaması lazım. Bu tabi belli bir yaşın üzerinde olanlar için de bu KKTC Sağlık Bakanlığı'nda olan bir komite var. O da izin alıyor. Peki bir hasta yurt dışında size duydu, gelmek istiyor size. Onun prodüsörü nedir? Nasıl başlıyor bu gelme? Kısaca üzeysi olarak da anlatılır. Şimdi tabi e, bizi hasta bir şekilde telefonla e, buluyor. E, arıyor. Biz ona yapılması gereken testleri söylüyoruz. Onları hazırlıyor. Bu internet ortamında bu bilgileri bizimle paylaşıyor. Bütün dosyasını hazırlıyoruz. Eğer bulunduğu yerde yani hangi ülkedeyse orada bu işin zorunlu ancak bir hekim varsa o hekim hastanın tedavi sürecini takip edin yapıyor. Böyle bir durum yoksa hastalığı bilgilerek geliyor. Biz kontrolü devralıyoruz. İlaçları tarif ediyoruz. Kendine mevcut bekliyor. İlaçları kullanıyor, kullanıyor. Geliyor buraya. Yaklaşık 5 gün, 6 gün burada kalıyor, işlemi bitiriyoruz ve kendine bitiriyoruz. Oluyoruz. Bazen tabii tadil yapma fırsatı da oluyor, sıcak aylara rastlarsa. Genellikle zaten e, hasta bir deniz planı kalıyorlar. E, yani embriyo transferi kadar zaten deniz planı. Bu işlemlerde ücret olarak hep paket olamıyor. Değişik, e, tabii ki değişik uygulamalar var. Burada, Tıbbın e, sağladığı bütün tüp bebek teknikleri uygulanıyor burası. Burada e, bir serbestlik içerisinde zaten bu kadar yabancı hastanın gelmesinin sebebi de bu. Buradaki sektörün gelişmesinin sebebi de bu. Aslında bakarsanız KKTC vatandaşı olan e, insanların yüksek 270 bin kişi. En son sayımda 270 bin kişi 15 tane tutuyor. Yani zaten çok yani olağanüstü fazla. Ancak zaten bu tüpüvek merkezlerinin kurulma amacı yurt dışından gelen hastalara hizmet vermek. Aslında bu bir sağlık turizmi. Evet. Ve... Aynı zamanda ülkeye bir gelir getiriyor. Kesinlikle. Evet. Ve sanırım mesela şunu söyleyebilirim. KKTC'ye gelen tüp bebek için müracaat eden hasta sayısı 80 milyon Türkiye'ye gelen tüp bebek için müracaat eden hasta sayısı muhakkatıdır. Evet. Bunu söylediğimde yani bu kadar bir yeri olduğunu anlayabiliriz. Peki IVF treatment oldu, hastamız başarılı oldu, mahvede oldu. Hamilelik süreci içerisinde memleketimiz oluyor, doğum nerede yapıyor? Şimdi tabii ki e, genellikle 9 ay 10 gün burada kalmak istemiyorlar. Herkes kendi memleketlerine gidiyor. Orada normal rutin e, takiplerini yapıyor, orada doğuruyor. Evet. Nereden geldilerse orada doğuruyor. Peki doğumdan sonra ziyaretlerin hastalarını buluyor mu? Şöyle doğumdan sonra gibi. genellikle ikinciyi, hatta üçüncüyü, hatta dördüncüyü yaptıkça gelenler oldu. Yani 18 yıldır. Ya ben hatırlıyorum bir hastamız. Sıfırla başladı, yedi tane çocuğu oldu. Peki sizin duygularınız nasıl? Sonuçta başarılı bir 
Yani biz burada e, aslında bakarsanız e, sadece yaptığımız şey aslında aslanın bize verdiği yol tercihsi ben böyle işte buna tekrar geri koymam. Bunu zaten bir insan yoltası ya da bir insan işte sperm yapmak gibi bir konu olacak. Kardeşim bir yapı. Şöyle arz edebilirim size. Bir yumurtanın çekirdiğinde olan bir e, 9 milyar tane bilgisayar içerisinde olan tüm programlardan daha fazla. Ve tabii bunu gerçekten yapmak da mümkün değil. Aslında bütün detaylarını bilmek de mümkün değil. Evet, şimdiye kadar ancak 24 bin galiba gen tanımlanabiliyor. Normalde 26 bin kadar var. Bu kadar bunun yanında 1,5 milyon, 9, işte 9 milyar kolon var. Dolayısıyla yani işin moleküllerine kadar daha gidilebilir. Tamam, evet. Son bir soru. Alacak. Saymamıştınız da şimdiye kadar. Şimdiye Doktorluk kadar. hayatınızda kaç tane çocuk doğum yaptı? Ben, bakın ben e, Zeynep Kamil Hastanesi'nden mezun olduğumda e, ki orası çok yoğun çalışıyor benim mezun olduğum yıllarda yaklaşık 8-10 bin tane kadar çocuk doğurmuştu. Ama tabii bunlar kendilerinden gelip kalan insanlar da o yıllarda çok, evet. çok yaygın değil mi? Benim bahsettiğim 94 itibariyle. Daha sonra ise yani 96'da ben Türkiye'de yok yapmaya başladım. Sonra işte hem burası hem orası derken sanırım bir 24 yıl kadar oldu bu çocuk tüp bebekler. Bir kasabanın nüfusu kadar var değil mi? Anneyi babayı da koyarsanız evet. içinde 75 bin falan olur. Çok güzel. Ee, çok teşekkür ederiz. Arkadaşlar başka sorusu var mı? Yok mu? Evet buyur siz sorun. Ya, tamam mı? Tamam mı? Sorduğun çok teşekkür Oldu çok teşekkür ederim. Ben teşekkür ederim. Ben teşekkür ederim. Ya. Çok sağ olun. Gaz kim? Doktor gaz var ya. Kaz, kaz. Ha, kaza, ha, ha. Kaz orada biraz burun kırın etmiş. Bunlar da kaza bunun odayı verdik abi. Doktor Ayşe, Ayşe. Her Ayşe. gün gidip geliyor. Ayşe gelecek diye biz tutuyorduk odayı Canan'ın adına. Ayşe gelmeyince... Ha. Kaçıncısı? Yedincisi miydi? O Ayşe'nin miydi o oda? Kaçıncısıydı bu? Ben biliyorum sen miydi? Yedincisi değil mi? Yedinci. Ha. Yedinci abi. İlkinde evet. burada yaptık galiba değil mi? Şimdi rica edeceğim. Konuşacağım. Birinci biz. Bak. Sen ilk geldiğinde bu otelde değil mi? Değil. değil. Burunun bir eskisi vardı. Biraz daha bahçeli bir şey vardı. Yani. Son sa, şey, hamaklı falan bir, bir yer vardı. Öncesinde. Bir başka. Ya şöyle düzeltelim diyorlar. Ben farklı değil de. Tamam kırmızı görürsün ya. Yolun. Evet evet hatırladım. Diğer otelde. Biraz kaldır doktor. Tamam getir. Leke mi var abi? Tamam. <gülüyor> şimdi leke yok evet, şimdi evet. öyle yemek de lekelendi. Evet e, Sayın Doktor Gazmani bu, bugün e, yedincisini gerçekleştiğimiz IVF Spring Sempozyumunu bugün bitirdik. E, bu sempozyumla ilgili misafirleriniz geldi bazı hocalar falan e, açıklamalar yaptı IVF ile ilgili. E, bahseder misiniz bu kişilerden biraz kimlerdir bunlar? İngiltere'den 30'un üzerinde tüp bebek kliniği 10 yıldan beri Doktor Halil İbrahim Bey'in yönettiği e, Kıbrıs Tüp Bebek Merkezi'ne, Kran Tüp Bebek Merkezi'ne e, ek donasyonu için hasta göndermekte. Yılda 250'nin üzerinde yeni hasta geliyor. 1000'in üzerinde son 9-10 yılda 1000'in üzerinde bebek doğdu İngiltere'de bu tedaviyle. İngiltere'de e, yumurta sıkıntısı olduğu için özellikle hastalar kuyrukta. İkincisi en önemli konulardan biri e, anonimity diye bir olay var. İngiltere'de donörler, yumurta veren anneler diyelim ya da yumurta vericiler e, kimliklerini saklayamama durumundalar. Evet. Ve bu, bu tedaviden doğan çocuklar 18 yaşına geldikleri zaman yumurtayı kim verdiyse onların kimliklerini ve adreslerini bulabiliyorlar. Bilmek mı? Bilmek zorunda değiller ama aileler eğer çocuk onun farkında olursa evet. GP'den ya da herhangi bir yerden öğrenirse an, ya da aile söylerse e, bu yumurta vericinin kişi, kimliğini, oturduğu yeri, bütün detaylarını elde etme hakkına sahip. Bu nerede bu, saklanıyor? Bu, bu Human Fertilization Authority diye bir yer var evet. İngiltere'de. Bütün IVF kliniklerinin zaten kayıtlı olduğu bir merkez. Oraya her yapılan IVF siklisi kaydolmak zorunda. 
böyle yumurta verme olayları olduğu zaman da bu bütün detaylar oraya kaydediliyor. Bu yüzden yumurta vermeyi düşünen e, potansiyel vericiler de e, vermekten genelde vazgeçiyorlar. Düşünen varsa da vazgeçiyor. Alıcı olanlar da onu istemiyorlar. Çünkü genellikle yumurta alıp da çocuk sahibi olsalar bile sonuçta çocuklar kendilerinin olacağı için o işi unutup devam etmek. Bütün ailelerin isteği. Ailemi kurdum. Teşekkür ederim. Çocuk benim. Ben büyüteceğim. Bundan sonra da bu işi karıştırmak istemiyorum. Bütün %99'u hastalığı bu, bu görüşte. Evet. Şahsen ben de aynı görüşteyim. Ama bunun, bundan farklı görüşte olanlar da var. O yüzden hastaların çoğunluğu sıra beklememek için, donörleri seçebilmek için. Burada çok e, yüksek sayıda donör olduğu için ve donörlerin çoğu da Slav ırkından olduğu için Çekoslovak. Rus, Ukrayna e, backgroundlı, çoğu üniversite mezunu ve seçilmiş donörler oldukları için. Buna daha çok genç nesiller mi? Hepsi genç. Evet. Yaş çok önemli. Evet. 26'nın 27 yaşın üzerinde zaten donör bulmak çok gereksiz. E, genç olması şart. Evet. Daha önce çocuğu olmuş donörler oldukları için e, e, doğurganlıklarını da ispat etmiş durumdalar. Şu donör seçimi çok önemli. Peki maksimum yaş arası nedir? Donör... 20 28'dir genellikle. 28'den yukarı olmaması lazım. Çok çok çok seyrek. O da onlar da şöyle oluyor. Eğer mesela bir hastamız bir, bir donörle gebe kalırsa diyelim gebe, e, donör 27 28 yaşındaysa 2 sene sonra hastamız tekrar gelip de aynı donörden tekrar yumurta istiyorum derse Donör de 29 yaşında ve hala şartları uygunsa, vermek istiyorsa yumurtayı ki öyle oldu e, durumlar, e, donöre teklifi götürüyoruz. Akrabalardan falan donör alıyor mu? Yasak. Yasak değil, oluyor. Yasak, oluyor. Ama e, genellikle insanlar tercih etmiyorlar. Çünkü dediğim gibi böyle bir yumurtayı alıp da ailesini kurduğu Peki. zaman... E, il, i, o, o ilişkiyi kopartmak istiyor. Benim çocuğum, benim oldu. Zaten kadın e, çocuğu taşıyıp da annelik, o, anneliği hissedip çocuğu doğurduktan sonra onların çocuğu artık onunla başkasının ilintisini devam ettirmek istemiyor evet. şahıs olarak. Ama bizle bağlarını hiç kopartmıyorlar. Benim de bağlarını devam ettiren en çok büyük grup, en büyük grup hastam donör hastalarıdır. Doktor Bey'e geliyorlar. Kıbrıs'ta özel olarak tatil olarak Kıbrıs'ı seçip sırf çocuğu getirip bize gö göstermek için e, tatil yapanlar var burada. Evet. E, Bu donörlere bir ücret veriyor musunuz? Efendim? Donörlere ücret veriyor musunuz? Donörle tabii ücretli. E, şeylerin çok çok büyük bir ücret almıyorlar. Ama donörler e, bir tedavi sonucu donör olabiliyorlar zaten. Yani en az 3 hafta 4 hafta süreyle bir tedavide bulunuyorlar. Ee, ondan sonra yumurta toplamak için anestezi altına giriyorlar. Bence donörlere ücret zaten verilmesi lazım. Bir teşekkür e, kabilinde. E, çok yüksek bir miktar değil. Ama e, o, 2 3 bin ister herhalde değil mi? Aşağı yukarı. E, o civarda. E, ama onları da bir evine bir şey alıp da bir kenara koysa e, yarın öbür gün hatırlayabileceği bir, bir hediye. Diyelim. Aynı kişi kaç defa donör olabilir? En fazla üç kere donör olabiliyor. Çünkü on, gerçi onun tıbbi bir nedeni yok. Evet. Yani tıbben on kere de donör olmak isteseniz olabilirsiniz. Çünkü tüp, tüp bebek tedavisi oluyor olsanız kendiniz, çocuğunuz olmasa on kere tüp bebek yaptıracağım derseniz olabilirsiniz. Ama donörlük e, biraz hani keyfe keder olduğu için, seçilmiş bir şey olduğu için sonuçta ee, uzun çok uzun vadede e, belki e, insanlar bunu hani bir ticarete dönüştürebilir yumurta verdim verdim parasını aldım 10 gün sonra bir daha vereceğim bir ay sonra bir daha onu o şekilde gelmesin diye İngiltere'de bu üç defadır biz de İngiltere'de konulan e, sınırları burada uygulamaya e, soktuk anlaşmamız zaten öyleydi. Ee, o şey burası için kural olmamasına rağmen biz o kuralı kendimize uyguluyoruz. Üç defa bizim için. Gelelim e, bu sempozyuma, iki günün süren sempozyuma. E, biraz e, bahseder misiniz e, sempozyuma kadar? Bu sempozyumun yedincisini yaptık. Her geçen yıl daha fazla ilgi çekiyor. E, 
özelliği ve çok çok öğretici bir sempozyum oluyor her seferinde. E, büyük toplantılardan çok daha faydalı çünkü e, bu işi yapan insanlar, her gün bu işi yapan insanlar bir araya gelip hangi konuları tartışmak istediklerine karar veriyorlar öncelikle. Bir sene öncesinden karar veriyoruz hangi konuları tartışalım diye. O bir sene içerisinde kendi aramızda konuşuyoruz, e-mailleşiyoruz. Şu konuyu kime, kimle, kim konuşsun, kim açıklasın. E, kendi aramızda en iyisini olabileceğini planladığımız, karar verdiğimiz küçük bir grup diyelim. 10 kişilik e, bir, bir konuşmacı grubu toplam iki günde. Bu, bu işi yapıyor. Ama çok select. Ee, büyük toplantılarda e, bu sefer 70-80 kişi kadar bir delegemiz var. E, tabii tabii hepsi hemen hemen İngiltere'den. E, e, bunun yani e, devamında e, mesela gel gelecek yıl için şimdiden e, planlamayı yaptık. İngiltere'de bir e, önce bir, bir günlük e, bir study group gibi bir şey yapacağız. Bir workshop yapıp ondan sonra gelip burada gelecek sene o workshop'ın sonuçlarını bir konuş bir saatlik workshop'ın sonuçlarını tartışacağız mesela. Böyle bir çalışmanı isteseniz milyonlarca pound dökseniz başka yerde ayarlayamazsınız. Şu konuşmacılar mesela konuşmacılardan bir tanesi bugün konuşanlardan Chris Chris Yap diye bir Oxford profesörü var. Evet. Ee, kendisi İngiliz hükümetine ve dünyanın büyük şirketlerine ve diğer hükümetlerine danışmanlık yapan birisi. Futurist dedikleri. Hani bizde analist ya da geleceği gören diyelim. Ee, dinlediyseniz falan da konuşması çok çok uzun görüşlü bir konuşmaydı. Ee, onun konuşması için dünyanın her yerine davet edip çok büyük rakamlarla e, konuşturulan bir insandır mesela kendisi. Çok değerli. E, böyle konuşmacılarımız var. E, bizim için çok yararlı oldu. Bu yılda, geç, geçen yıllarda öyle. Şey Sizin için yeni bir şey. Ya da bu alanda IVF ile şey. ilgili yeni şey. yenilikler tek. IVF'in geleceğine bakıyoruz esasında. Yani biz zaten hani Övünmek demeyelim ama şuradaki insanlar İngiltere'deki IVF ünitelerinin başındaki insanlar. Zaten IVF'in yeniliklerini biz yapıyoruz. Evet. O yüzden bize yeni söylenecek bir şey hakikaten yok. Biz şimdi IVF gelecekte 2020'de, 2040'da ne olabilir diye bakıyoruz. Ve eğer dikkat ettiyseniz... Ee, o konuşmana Chris Yap'ın konuşmasından bir örnek vereyim. Ee, hani hastaneler ortadan yani şimdi çok geleceği konuşuyoruz ama evet. hani bildiğimiz şekilde hasta tedavisinin muhtemelen ortadan kalkmasından bahsediyoruz. Bu olur mu şimdi olmaz mı bu iki senede olacak şey değil. Ama bir normal üniversitede bir karşılaştırma verecek olursak normal üniversiteden açık üniversiteye geçiş gibi Hani bugün senin bildiğin e, polikliniğe gidip sıra bekleyip doktor görüp kan aldırıp şekilde hasta hastane ilişkisi değil de e, virtual reality hastane hasta hastane ilişkisi olacak. Yani? Yani internet üzerinden. Hasta artık doktora her gün gitmek. Hasta e, hasta gitmek gitme gibi. uzaktan. Her şey dijital oluyor herhalde. Her şey dijital. Yani mesela iğne olmayacaksın da diyelim diyabetiniz varsa bir bant kolunuzda o bant üzerinde mesela, mesela Hewlett Packard'ın Hewlett Packard da mesela bu, bu insan e, danışmanlık yaptı bir ara e, ink jet printerların çok ince şeyleri gibi iğneleri gibi o iğneler o kadar ince ki fark etmiyorsun bant Ama şeklinde tişört giyiyorsun tabi o, o senin kan şekerinin düzeyini anlayarak ona göre o iğnelerden şey verecek. E, di, gli, şey de, insülin ve glikoz verecek şeye göre. 
çok daha az insülini çünkü biz şu anda bir veriyorsun bir yükseliyor bir alçalıyor. Ne diye tanımlıyorsunuz onu şimdi? Yelek mi diyorsunuz ya da sağlık gereği mi diyorsunuz? Ya da... Şimdi artık onların, onların bir ismi yok şu anda çünkü bunlar çok daha yeni gelişen şeyler. IVF için de aynı şey. Şu anda biz sabahtan bir iğne yaptırıyoruz kadına. Her gün sabahleyin bir iğne yapıyor ki yumurtalıkları itelim. Şimdi onun daha doğrusu muhtemelen bir bant olur. Oradan sürekli yüksek dozda o ilaç verilir. Ama pat pat sabah akşam sabah akşam o yükselmez. Onun dozu bir yükseliyor. Akşama kadar düşüyor. Sabah bir daha. 10 gün böyle devam ediyor. O sürekli değil. Bence öyle olacak. Muhtemelen hastalara gidip görmeyeceğiz. İnternetten ben günde 10 tane daha fazla hasta görebilirim. Yolda bir sürü vakit kaybediyorum. Kan testi için falan gitmenize gerek olmayacak. Evde takacaksın koluna aleti. O senin kan, tansiyon, kalp atışı neyse. Onlar aynı zamanda merkezi sistemde monitör olacak mı? Tabii. Dijital olarak. Tabii. Zaten şu anda var da her yerde kullanılmıyor. Şu anda ameliyat yapabiliyorsun. Ben burada oturup Japonya'daki bir çocuğun üzerinde ameliyat yapabilirim mesela. Bu var ama... 24 saat hasta izleyebiliyor. Tabii, tabii. Ama şey olarak kullanılmıyor. Her yerde kullanılmıyor. Muhtemelen belki mesela yarı şaka, yarı ciddi verilen örneklerden biri. Bunu gazeteye yazmaya gerek yok ama mesela belki bir infertilite kilotu diye konuştu. Şortu ya da. Evet, evet. Yani o, o hormonları mı ölçer, ilacı mı verir aynı zamanda yoksa hepsini birden mi yapar? Giyersin. Erkekler için mesela sıcak iyi değildir. O organları değişik pozisyonda tutup da serinlemesini sağlar. Yoksa hava dolaşımını sağlayıp serinletir mi? Üç ay içer, üç ay önü giyersen sperm kaliten yükselir mi? O tip şeyler bunlara bakıyoruz. Yani iç çamaşırı bile seçiyorsunuz yani. E, iç çamaşırı bile elektronik oluyor. Var ama yani. Ama böyle şeylere bakmak lazım. Yoksa öbür köyler zaten yap yapıyoruz yani. Başka böyle bir şeylere düşünmedikten sonra. Doktor Chris'in söyledikleri de bunlar bu çerçevede şeyler. Efendim? Doktor Chris bu çerçevede. Tabii tabii asıl o, o yani mesela örnekler verdi. Bu şeyler e, iPad'ler bilmem ne. Bunlar bir günde olan şeyler değil ama baktığın zaman dedi 1940'ta adam iPad gibi bir şeyi planlamaya başladı. 1960'ta şu oldu. Yok ondan sonra şöyle bir eğri vardı orada. Hemen 70'ten sonra iş gelişti. 80'lerde falan eline alabildin iPad'i. Hemen bir günü birlik olmuyor tabii. Ama 2020'den sonra falan büyük değişiklikler olacak gibi görünüyor hayatımızda diye düşünüyor herkes. Evet.